Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, episode 244. I am your host, Michael. Uh, joining me this week, Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, George from Hands of Fire, um, Hands of Fire Boxing Podcast, uh, Daniel from The Inscriber, What You Need, joining us live from overseas from uh, Trinidad. Uh, let's get things going this evening. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report live YouTube show, live podcast, as well as YouTube show and blog discussing all things boxing. Motto is when when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. And we talked about a whole lot of bad during the pre-show. Um, bottom line is if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. If you want to find out all information, Regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, blog page is the place to go to, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. Check the top right of the blog page. You'll find links to find Pound for Pound Box Report all over social media, where you can find the podcast on all available platforms that carry the podcast. And I'm here to officially announce that Pound for Pound Box Report is now on Spotify. So you can hear not only this particular episode, but all previous episodes on Spotify. So yeah, uh, we're stepping it up. Pound for Pound Box Report is on Spotify. Uh, let's get things going. And what I'm gonna do is because there's so many fights that went down this weekend, so many fights we had to preview, I'm going to let everybody talk about one specific fight and then I'm gonna break it up so each person can talk about an individual fight. I'm going to talk about the one particular fight in which I want all com commentary on. Uh, fight took place over the weekend in um, StubHub. I'm still calling it StubHub. I don't give a damn about the name change. Mama called him StubHub. I'm calling him StubHub. Um, Sean Porter in the main event defended his WBC welterweight title against um, Rodinus Ugas. I was covering um, boxing and writing recaps for boxing for threekings.com. So while I had the fight on, I wasn't paying the greatest attention to it. Uh, Porter won a decision, I think 115, 113 on all scorecards. But based on my boxing Twitter that night and based on a lot of commentary I've heard afterwards, a lot of people felt that Ugas won. What I did from what I did see, for me, and I'll go to you first on this one, Gail, and then everybody can follow up. The thing that had me scratching my head was the strategy of sean porter i didn't get it he's known as a rough rough rugged come forward physical fighter um and what you need we when we talked about it what, last week what you need uh discussed how rugged physical fighters can trouble cuban fighters but yet porter fought the opposite of that um which made the fight harder for him he tried to explain himself afterwards basically saying that what he was told was working but and what I saw from watching the fight, it wasn't working. Uh, Ugas was getting to him with shots, catching him with shots. To me, that was a knockdown that should have got called. Uh, just your overall thoughts of the fight. Do you agree with, with the decision? And riddle me the strategy of that Sean Porter employed for this fight. Well, it was a rough night for Mr. Porter. He is lucky to escape with that majority decision. So it was a majority decision. And the cards were all over the place. So the cards were 116 to 112 and 115 to 113 for Porter. Uh, and then there was a 117, 111 card for Ugas uh, from Judge Zachary Young. Backstory on this fight. For those of you that aren't aware, Porter blew through the weigh-in by two pounds. Um, he weighed way past, uh, he was at, I think, 148.8 or 9 on the, on the weigh-in. So he had two hours to lose two pounds. This is not something Porter does. Porter um, is normally in pretty good shape, pretty disciplined, so... A lot of question marks pop up over your head when that happens, when a guy, you know, welterweight blows through the weigh-in by two pounds. What the hell happened there? Well, Porter took off the weight. He owned it later and said, listen, it's all on me. I, it's not like I'm overlooking my opponent. It's not like I didn't work hard. I'm in good shape. I'm fine. Everything's all right. I own it. My mistake. Um, we're good. He made it, you know. Part of the way he made weight was 
you know, in addition to the usual drop trowel weigh in, you know, Sean has been growing out his hair quite a bit. He cut it all off. He cut off all the braids. So I don't know how much that helped him, but he didn't make weight. So that's the first question mark. Did it? He said he was fine. Of course, a fighter is always going to say they're just fine after they have to bust ass to make weight. Did that play into this? Did he have to play it safe because his conditioning was at, at question? Well, let's also remember his last fight against Danny Garcia. You know, he won with some really, really tight cards on that fight. So are we watching Sean Porter getting older? Or are we watching Sean Porter struggling to make weight? That to me is the big question. So Porter later said that his father, Kenny, who trains him, directed him to fight this way, directed him to box. Sean Porter is in no one's imagination a boxer. Sean Porter, um, God love him, one of the nicest, most gentlemanly stand-up guys in boxing is a very rough guy in the ring. He always has been rough around the edges. There is no finesse involved with Sean Porter's approach at its best. For whatever reason, that's what he decided to do. It was a mistake. He escaped by the skin of his teeth. Ugas, I, I thought was by far the better fighter, but the problem for Ugas, like a lot of guys that find themselves losing in the same position, is his best punches weren't the flashy snap someone's head back like a Pez dispenser. He did a lot of great work to the body, a lot of uh, damage that's hard to quantify. You know, you've got to be on the right side of the ring as a judge to really see the best of a guy like Ugas. And when they move around, you're only seeing little bits and pieces of it throughout the fight. They lose points on the scorecard because of that, unless they are able to kick in a flurry at the last 30 seconds of the round and steal it. And there's also the, you know, the taint, if you will, of the Cuban school of boxing, not being aggressive, right? So I thought Ugas pulled it out. It was not one of those fights where I'm screaming robbery because it was close, 115 to 113, would have been the right score. Max DeLuca had his 115 or 113 for Porter. Um, I would have scored it that way for Ugas. But, um, you know, it gave him some respect, some exposure. Um, you know, he's not one of the more well-known Cuban fighters, but at least he did get in the ring, did get a payday, got some work in. Uh, he'll get more fights out of it. But Sean Porter needs to rethink some things. I, after the fight, he talked about taking on pretty much any welterweight in the division he said he felt he could beat, although the one guy he conspicuously did not name was Terrence Crawford. But everybody else, he did. He's tripping. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And maybe he needs to move up and wait. That's, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, the way he fought uh, uh, over the weekend, he'd be food for Crawford. He'd be food for Spence, too. Uh, I'm going to go around the panel. Hey, I'm going to start with you, what you need. Uh, talk about your fight. And like I said, we mentioned last week how uh, pressure fighters, physical fighters, often give Cuban fighters trouble. Were you surprised that Porter decided to not be aggressive? He decided to step around, move around, box for large segments of the fight making it very, very comfortable for you in there. So your thoughts on the fight as well as, again, the question to you, just the strategy implored by one Sean Porter. So um, I wasn't surprised after I saw what the style that Ugas actually employs. Um, Ugas, there are some Cuban fighters who actually are pressure fighters. So Ugas is more of a pressure fighter. I didn't realize that. And he, if you look at uh, all his punch stats before and and uh, even after the fight, his punch stats show that he's a body puncher. He's really good at placing body shots. If you notice, he was landing the liver shot really well and easy on, uh, on Porter. So that's why Porter chose and Kenny Porter chose to box him and to stay on the outside. But because they have a shorter reach, they have to go in and out. So Porter worked off his jab 
you'll notice that Porter was very successful at jabbing Ugas at the right time. Um, but I critiqued Porter. He could have done more. Um, I critiqued Ugas. Ugas could have done more. Now, the reason why Ugas couldn't do as much as he wanted to is because Sean Porter was so quick, one. And two, Sean Porter kept on changing up the looks. His style was different. He was moving around the ring sometimes. He stayed planted and then suddenly just shotgun jab on him, you know? So Porter, uh, the thing that I didn't like about Porter was his unnecessary movement at times. He would move around the ring just unnecessarily where he could have just stayed in front of Ugas and just jabbed him because Ugas wasn't going to come forward. Ugas was confused by what Porter was doing, so Ugas stayed put instead of coming in on Porter. Usually Ugas will pressure a guy. You know who's cut something like Ugas and it's a Cuban boxer? Um, Sullivan Barrera is kind of like that, but there's another guy that faced Jean Pascal. I don't know if you guys remember him. Um, I forgot what his name is. It's a great fight with John Pascal. Some people thought Pascal lost that fight. It's Cuban boxer as well. And he, he, Ugas reminds me of that style where the guy, he keeps his two guard in front of him and he's coming to you, right? So um, by and large, I thought Sean Porter won the fight and mainly off of his jab. He was out jabbing Ugas a lot. Um, on the inside, Porter was kind of wild. Ugas was more the guy that was landing the, the the better shots, even though Porter did land a couple good shots inside. But on the outside, Porter really was doing better than Ugas. Once Porter stayed on the outside, dipped in, and then got back out of there, he did better. Also, it would have been rather stupid for Porter to remain on the inside. If you notice, Ugas is physically the stronger fighter in that fight. Um, he's the one hitting hitting with the harder shots and everything. So if you, from the time I saw the way and I was like, you know what? Yes. Thank you very much, Gail. That's the name. Uniski Unis, Gonzalez. Anybody remember that guy? Yep. Unieski Gonzalez. And yes, yes, he, yes. Um, yeah, he, that was a razor close fight. Um, he, yeah, he lost to Pascal in that razor close fight. And then he fought, of all people, Vlacheslav Shabransky. And right. he, he lost that one by a razor thin decision. And honestly, he should have won both of those fights. It, it was a toss up. You could have yeah. won one way or the other. But they yeah. favored the, the upcoming guy. So that's, that's the kind of fighter, kind of like, not exactly, because Ugas has a lot more skill in terms of how he boxes and everything. But that's the style that Sean Porter was going up against. So it would have been stupid for Sean Porter to go against the stronger guy on the inside as well as try to – and then Porter's not the most accurate boxer in the world. He has a pretty decent jab. But he doesn't – so, it, you know, uh, Ugas would have killed him on the inside. So he was in and out, in and out, and then he would box and just kind of go around the circle. So his dad realized, you know what, because they were their plan was to box Ugas, break him down, and then crash him in the end. But the father realized, you know what, that ain't, that's not even going to make sense to do. So they just boxed him on the outside. If you look at Porter's face, his eyes were all kind of bruised up. That's to tell you how powerful Ugas was. So, yeah, that was not a fight where Sean Porter could stop Ugas. No way. Too strong, uh, too good on the inside. So he had to box him. That's why the strategy was that. And it's a good strategy, in my opinion. Um, I just thought that. Porter could have done more. He could have gone to the inside a little bit more, but I think Ugas hurt him in, I can't remember which round, he hurt Sean Porter in a round. And Sean Porter was like, you know what? I think I'm staying on the outside. And then he just started to circle Ugas and go, like he, he started to go as far away from Ugas as possible. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Like he would, he would use the entire ring <laughs> to avoid Ugas, which was pretty interesting. And then he would come in at certain points. So I think Ugas was strong enough to hurt him and he did the wise thing by just boxing him on the outside, coming in on the inside sometimes, using his speed and, and, and landing shots and then going leaving, getting out as quickly as he could, you know? So I think that's mm -hmm. the point. Uh, George and Daniel, uh, your thoughts on what went down? Well, um, to start off, I think Porter won the fight. Um, <clears throat> I do have a habit, though, of at least initially watching a fight, I, I don't score it. And I'm 
just <laughs> just initially i did this for some reason I, I don't know i just have i don't have the nerve really to actually just do it i'm too too mixed into the fight to really um do it i can maybe go for the first four and and, and pretty much after that i'm lost um but um Again, even after the rewatch, I still felt that um, that Porter did win the fight. And like you were, uh, at least to, to the original point of your question, is this the, the strategy that was employed by um, Porter was, was very questionable. And uh, and it actually all, I feel like all of this really pieces together, even with what uh, Gail was mentioning as, as far as the strategy on why they're even doing this in the first place. Um, for starters, I'll just, I'll just talk about the fight and I'll, get into at least why I think it's all tying together. Um, the the fight overall, like you mentioning, uh, Porter tried his best to stay on the outside. Um, and and with the length that U- Ugas had, it was just it was just always going to be a problem. That length, he was l- consistently losing the jab battle. And that's what I think a lot of those lacerations on the eyes were really from, at least the bruising was just the consistent jabbing and 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 like um and like you were mentioning what you needed i think he was really just reeling some at least his, the punches he was landing um uh, weren't you know what he always was fancying wanting to get but um he was just landing at least what he could for whatever angle that he was at um and they were just all just really just somewhat thudding shots it's almost heavy-handed and, and created a reaction for, for porter almost all the time and what he was struggling to do was uh trying to you know go in and out um but i found it strange though was that even when there was times that you know he would get caught up a little bit and as a fighter naturally when you get you know caught with a couple of shots you're like you know wait a minute you know you're, you're, you 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 just want to go for the exchange like wait a minute you're not just going to hit me like that and you're going to get caught with with something um and he was actually doing pretty good and his, his best moments were when he was inside um and again, it just part part of that whole strategy. He, he did his best. He, you know, he got inside. He got hit with a couple of shots, and then he went again, right back into uh, to, to boxing. And like you were saying, uh, what you need, he would pretty much run across the whole other side of the neutral corner, uh, almost like as far as the whole reset to deal with it. And I th- found it just incredibly strange, considering that's not the Porter we known. We've never seen him necessarily try to, you know, really go for a strategy like that um and and you know there, i mean there's a reason that's the whole phrasing of a boxer puncher is because you know while you can be a banger uh you got your your, your fighters and, you know, and it's not nothing new to see punchers employ a boxing strategy and actually be successful i mean we see gennady golovkin pull a master boxing performance really with that jab more or less against david lemieux um and plenty of others um, I mean, I can really just dig up a bunch actually now thinking about them, but, uh, I mean, just, there's, there, there's times where that works. There's just some fighters that just don't have that ability to go beyond that. And I think that goes into the point of the whole strategy being suggested in the first place by his father. Um, I feel like people, and I don't, you know, this is, uh, I wouldn't say too far from my own assessment, but feel that. Porter is someone who's more or less holding the title uh, for, for someone else who's, uh, who you know, for, really for someone more or less on the come up to looking to take that. And I think they see that is just because he's just a, a sloppy looking guy. And I, and I know countless guys who, who watch Porter and fans that are just really frustrated by him uh, and his aggressive style often really even um, hampering his own chances really with his own um, attempts trying to, you know, go on the inside. And um, I just think that uh, I think that what, what, what his father is noticing is that, you know, other people are seeing that, too. And they're trying to maybe make him a little bit more versatile as a fighter. And, uh, and maybe this was the camp where <laughs> I guess they were maybe experiencing with that. And even with if you noticed a lot of the uh, the reaction, I just was noticing just a lot of behavior in, the, in that fight. A lot of uncertainty with um with porter uh especially after the fight uh right away i mean he looked right at his corner and it was like it was almost like the look that he almost gave to his dad was like you see i told you this strategy wouldn't fucking work like why would you why look how close this fight was and i don't feel it was necessarily that close or at least comfortable with this one because we did this and i felt like that's 
you know, I don't feel like that's something, I guess, just under the surface. I don't have any sourcing on that at all. Um, but it's um, just something that j it just seemed to be highly noticeable. Um, credit to you guys, though. Um, I know he was at least a good, good come forward fighter. Um, I felt like, if anything, his stock maybe grew uh, just on the perception of him just winning the fight. So I guess there's uh, winners on both sides. To your last point, uh, we may see. It, it seems like that you're saying that, that that Porter may have been at odds with his dad coming into the fight, and then furthermore after the fight, um, like I, like you said, you don't want to read into that. For me, uh, the questions about that George that will tell after his next fight if he struggles again. Yeah. I mean, and that's again, it's a characteristic that he's because he's so professional and he's a, he's a darling for PBC. They love having him, uh, you know, you know, for their um, color commentator. And, you know, he, he's a great face. He's a great guy. Um, and he actually could see a little bit of frustration even, too. Um, if you notice, there was like a moment after that way in where he's kind of somewhat on a he's kind of like berating a little bit. And it's like the most emotional I've, I think I've ever seen him. Uh, where it's like, look, you guys need to stop looking into this. It, you know, this is all my fault. There's nothing else. There's nothing this going on or chat's going on or, or whatever. This is on me. I didn't, you know, it was just a mistake that I made. I didn't take my obligation serious and and and, and, and whatever. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just it, a noticeably agitated Porter was, uh, was something I found just just starkly different going into that fight. Um, almost made me even want to change my decision on uh, as far as who I was going to pick to win that fight. Uh, but, I mean, considering Maurice Hooker went into the same situation somewhat, I think he made out with his uh, in a highly different manner. But, you know, I guess we can talk about that later, too. Yeah, we can talk about that a little. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, your reaction to what went down uh, Saturday night. Do you think that that, that Porter – Deserved a decision, and again, I'll ask the question to you that I'm asking to everybody else. Uh, your thoughts on the strategy that at Sean Porter uh, chose for this fight? Porter, yeah, it's a close fight. I don't, I don't have a problem with you saying that Porter won the fight, but and I don't have a problem saying people Ugas won the fight. I, I'm not going to call it a robbery per se, because one the things that are telling. Is sometimes visual. Ugas is hitting the harder shots uh, in some rounds, but at the same time, since since round two, he's been bleeding from the mouth. So that that's a mini turn in one area. But as far as strategy, I don't know if they tried a little bit too much to try to think. Oh, it's a Cuban fighter. I'll try to outbox the boxer, and then just win because I'll be I'll put a little bit more pressure afterwards. It's kind of a bad strategy when Ugas wasn't really that type of fighter. The problem, though, is going to be is what happened at the weigh-in because I, I think the frustration that you see from Porter's camp in many ways when he had to cut the hair because this is the first time they've, they've really had to do go this far to make weight. And it's right at the time where they get the belt the second time. The first time... They were able to defend it. And like I said, now this time, like right about you when you're going to the, right, you only got to defend it once and before. Actually, yeah, once when he fought Malinaj and then he wanted to find and kill Brooke. And then on this one, you weren't even going to make your first defense. I get the frustration in that area. The strategy, yeah, it, 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 it took away from what a, lot, what a lot of what Sean Porter does as a fighter. Like, Yes, he comes in, he bull rushes, he can smother you at times. So that's actually his best attributes, the fact that he can pressure you at certain points. You, you, don't, you don't need to make him something that he isn't, in a way, which is what that strategy was. You were making him what he wasn't. But what's probably going to be telling to his first fight is what division is going to be under, because we have to remember, he's been... He started like in the Olympic career, his amateur career in many ways, and I think early on is at middleweight. So he's been one of these guys that has been drastically cutting down 
for power. And eventually it catches up to you. It catches up, it catches up to the best of you and the most and the most lucrative of fighters. We've seen what happened to Canelo. He couldn't do this 155 deal for too long. And eventually his body would, would give out. And now you're even seeing like when he attempted super midway, that maybe his body's saying you waited too long to make the move. It may be time. I I know Porter wants to be a fighting champion. I know Porter wants to defend this title, but it may be time. Yeah, you have to go up to one fifty four, because your body is pretty much telling you you can't cut this anymore. You're getting older. Your conditioning is one of the best attributes, but at the same time, that doesn't last forever. So maybe it's time to finally move on. Like as a WBC champion, he does have the option to challenge Harrison if he wants to. As a champion of the lower weight division, he does that have that right by WBC rules. Or you know what? For the right, you can fight Jamar Tarda because that'll be a good fight. If you have it in the sense, a good well round of boxer or somebody that can come in forward like Sean Porter does when it comes to Jamel. So there's a lot of things to focus on in this fight. It was like I said, it's a close fight. I agree with the decision. I'm fine with the people that think of the Ugas one too. But we also have to take into account how late these fights have been. Uh, how bad, how badly was the stop hub center? How empty was it when you saw it? I, I think uh, Jacob. I think if you're on, were you there? And how? And if you were, how empty was that place? I think Gail was there, but it, I, I saw pictures. It was empty. I was not there because I was not going to freeze my Southern California ass off outside in uh, March. But I spoke the image of the <laughs> image of big ass Lennox Lewis out there covered up yeah. like a baby at the no. and, uh, he was sitting there with a full blown snuggie. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and Joe Goosen, who was providing color on the broadcast, was wearing mittens. Honest to God, like kid mittens, like like kids wear. Um, I talked to several people yesterday who were there, including one reporter who writes for Japanese media. She was there to the bitter end, the last walk-off fight. And she said maybe 1,500 people at its max. And she said there were definitely fewer people there than there were for the last HBO card where um, both Cecilia Brockus and Clarissa Shields fought. And I was there for that one. And there's no way there were more than 2,000 people there. For a lot of it, it was probably less than that, 1,000, 1,500. So we're talking, you know, they could have moved the whole card across the street to the Doubletree Hotel in Carson and fit everyone in the ballroom. It was that bad. And there were 14 fights. Somebody needs to discuss their business model in a serious way. That was a disaster. I want to touch on that, uh, but I'm going to get Jacob's um, analysis first. We're going to touch on that for a little bit. We talked about it during the pre-show, but quickly, Jacob, your thoughts on uh, Porter, his win over Ugas. Um, you know what? I thought Porter was going to win this fight, but honestly, you know, and watching it and judging it, I thought he lost the fight. I thought Ugas should have been, you know, he deserved to win that decision. Um, but you know, it's, you know, it was a, it was a tough fight. You know, there were there were some competitive parts of it, but I felt like Ugas was putting on the pressure, the effective pressure. Um, Porter was seemed to be, you know, missing a lot. You know, he he would go for those kind of like haymakers. Um, he would have his best success, I think, when he would get inside, but. Ugas was using his distance well and um, being able to pick him off. But, uh, you know, you know, I th think you guys were talking about the whole weight issue. You know, I don't know how long Porter can stay at, at this weight. I mean, it's one of my biggest pet peeves, and I know it's one of Gail's, is, is not being able to make weight. You know, you, you have plenty of time to prepare. But if, you, if, you, if you're getting that close and you're not making weight and you have to take that – extra time that you're allotted, I, I think, you know, it's a time to start thinking about maybe moving up a division. Hmm. Um, Follow-up question for everyone. Uh, 
everybody's talking about uh, maybe Porter should move up in weight, uh, given the fact that he had to lose uh, almost two pounds coming in. But before that, given the negative reaction he's received um, in the aftermath of this win, question for everybody, do you think he should fight a rematch with Ugas first before considering moving up to uh, 154 pounds? No. No. I, I, no. I think I think Ugas deserves a rematch. I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. I don't think he deserves a rematch because, as I said before, I thought Porter beat him, and clearly, in my opinion. And also that 12th round so-called knockdown, it wasn't a knockdown, in my opinion. Ugas hit him in the back of the neck, the back of the head, after Porter had blocked it. Yeah, that that I agree with. I that did not seem like a knockdown to me at all. I think Jack Reese made the right call, and honestly, it wouldn't have made that much difference in the fight. I think people are rating Ugas highly because they expected Porter to go in there, beat him up, and get him out of there. I think that's what that's happening. And I th I think honestly, I don't think Porter should have stayed in the pocket too long with Ugas because, as I said before, he's landing good liver shots, good body shots when he could. Uh, I thought Porter should have gone in there, do, do his thing, get out. So a shotgun jab, follow it up with a, a body shot or some kind, and get out. That's how I, I, I tell you, Ugas is strong. He's a strong, he's like Unieski Gonzalez, man. Um, I'm going to touch on this topic before we move on to other fights. We were talking, having a discussion before uh, we started things. And Gail, you disclosed some uh, issues in terms of the finances, in terms of pay scale. Uh, for the entire card, could you touch on that right quickly? Because I can't get I can't get this out of my head. Um, the disparity in terms of who got paid the most on this card, who got paid the least, and um, the folks who got paid the the least uh, got paid the least in a ridiculous amount that I found offensive. Yeah, it it really was offensive. You know, these guys work harder than nearly anyone in sport, and that's part of the reason that we're all here uh, watching. Uh, the purses were listed by ESPN's senior boxing writer and probably the most senior boxing journalist in America, Dan Rayfield. They were no surprise and he frequently does post um, the purses. So he did the other night and let me pull this up, which I'm scrolling through to take a look for. I. I will read the purse numbers, and I have to admit I was absolutely shocked. So here we go. All right. So the official contract purses. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only money they made if they've got a side promotional deal or a cut of the tickets and so forth. And usually that means the guys in the main event or the co-main. Um, the opponents and the guys on the undercard, purse money is usually all they get. So Sean Porter earned $1.25 million, Ugas $300,000 as the opponent. That's not, that's a pretty normal disparity for guys in the main event when they are, both, both don't have a title. Um, the co-main between Ramos and Santana, they both made 50K. Now, F.A. Agjagba, the big Nigerian heavyweight, who a lot of people find very exciting, very interesting guy on the come up. F.A. made 8000 bucks to fight Amir Mansoor, uh, a well-known name, particularly in uh, Southern California, who um, is on the decline of his career. Part of my dog's growling about this. They're pissed off, too. Yeah, your dogs uh, are offended. Yeah, they well, are. They're, they're, bo they're boxers. They're offended. Um, Mansoor, interestingly enough, made twenty five grand to fight uh, Jogba, and you know, that was a pretty quick 25k since uh, Jogba blasted him. Um, then we get down to the fight between Damian Vasquez and Juan Carlos Payano. Most of you saw Payano get knocked out viciously by Naoya Inoue in the World Boxing Super Series. Fine, he lost, he lost badly, but let's remember, he was just considered worthy of being in the World Boxing Super Series. So Vasquez made 15 grand, Payano made five grand. This is a guy whose last fight was in the World Boxing Super Series. Then we get down to Robert the Ghost Guerrero, who was on the card, uh, who was a walk-off fight, by the way. He made 25 grand. His opponent from Colombia, Hevinson Herrera, not a household name, admittedly, made 
$1,000. That is offensive. That man could barely pay his costs of training and, and he gets paid a thousand dollars. I mean, that doesn't even, he loses money getting in the ring and fighting. Um, Jesus Cuellar was on the card, you know, a guy well known to a lot of fans has had some, you know, downs in his career. Well, he made 40 grand, his opponent, Carlos Padilla, funny enough, another Colombian fighter, another $1,000 payday. What is I mean, that? Was it was it two was it two for two thousand dollars? Was that the idea? You get two Colombians for a grand each if you buy them both. How, how much mean, is a dollar worth in Colombia? What the hell? And actually, Herrera, the um, Guerrero's opponent, he trains in Florida. He didn't come from Colombia. Um, Padilla apparently does train in Colombia. I I don't care what the exchange rate is. You cannot tell me. A thousand dollars U.S. is a fair price for anyone going into a fight like that. I doesn't some of the blame though go to the fighter for taking that money? I mean, they don't have to the, take well, it. Well, true, or the manager for not being straight about what the money was, or they're just so eager to get a fight they agree and they get up here and sign the paperwork, and it's oh, how much am I getting paid? And that and that does happen. How that, soon did Padilla that, get knocked out, though? Yeah. Well, yeah. But still, $1,000 barely covers your costs, especially if you're coming in from out of the country. Um, yeah. Do, do you think, though, that it has something to do with giving it, getting a chance to, to get on a card, and maybe they don't get paid a bunch of money, but if they upset that person, then that can lead to you know other money? Because I'm looking at this guy's schedule. I mean, his record is 24 and 17, but in 2018 he had four fight or three fights. He's had two fights this year, so I mean, he's he's very active. So well, and that's and that's those kind of guys do get fights because they're all over the place, and they and he's probably also getting paid to spar on top of that. You know, making that's hard. That's it's, a hard really way to it's really sparring money he just got. <laughs> pretty much, you know what? Pretty much, that is pretty much true. But I know sparring partners who make more than that. Got covered, but. You know, part of the problem is there were 14 fights on that card. 14 fights. That's a lot. Eight of those 14 fights were walk-offs after the broadcast. It, that is very poor planning. Let's just put it that way. That's too many fights. That's too late. Those guys are having a wait around. It's cold. That's not good for them at all. And who the heck do you think is still in the seats at 11 o'clock at night on the West Coast watching these guys? Maybe their team, maybe a few family and friends. It's just not a way to do business. I, I'm offended for them. Yes, I, I just say though, I, yes, it's a free country. I get it. They could they can say no. What, I'm, what but, I would say though, Gail, is uh, if you look at their records, right? I mean, how 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 do you pay them handsomely for a record like that? Like Padilla, he's basically uh, he's uh, what is he? He lost his he lost the last five fights he had fought. Yeah, and no, I I get it. That, on top of that, he has a record of sixteen, ten, and one. So I mean, the dude's trying to get a paycheck to live. So yeah, but but the this, problem is, I guy, can't. I can't this guy is a big it. name. And so you get a name on your resume. Maybe that helps your pay increase as well. Next. Well, time. maybe maybe back at home it does. But how in the world? In the second round. There's no way you can make a profit on that. I can't see how they're making any money. I mean, maybe it's maybe you are right. It's a loss leader for them. I I worry when I see purses like that. You know, I I get it. Sean Porter, you know, one point two five million. It's it's a great payday if you can get it. He's worked very hard to get to where he is. Exactly. Um, you can't. These guys have second jobs though too. But, but, but let me tell you, he, big payday. But you start thinking, all right, couldn't could he have made do with a million dollars or even a million point one, and we shuffle a couple hundred thou of that off to some of these other guys on the undercard, or maybe that's not his a, job though to well, to make sure his job. opponent oh. gets paid. Absolutely not. And part of the deal is you get to this point and you negotiate and Porter's a draw. He's the one. Let's face it. Porter is the much guy of a draw. Got 1, everybody people. 
Well, right, but but he is the only reason most of those people went at all, at all, the few that did. Most people thought, now nah, I'm staying home to watch the card out of New York, which we'll finally get around to talking to folks, I promise. Oh, man, well, uh, this, this is the part of it when I, I get what you need's argument. Yeah, they're not exactly undefeated like blue per, blue chip prospects, but undefeated is overstatement. No, that's what I mean. That's when they're not these prospects that are hot coming up. Then if we got to pay them, but I'm sorry, you a thousand dollars. I know for so a fact I, that I, 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 there's, no excuse for, I, there's no excuse for paying Payano that little. He, no, he was no. just the world champion. Wait, wait, wait. I, no, Payano is a different story, for real. No, but yeah, but let's put it in some of these fighters. For me to fly to Bolivia to see my family, that's over $1,000. That's about the average flight that you got to do from the U.S. to South America. And you're paying the guy less than what it makes to for him to just to fly here. That's that's insane. I know, yeah, they take care of the tickets and stuff, but that's insane. I'm sorry. Like you have to find a better way to put the arguments. And yes, it's not Sean Porter's job to split his purse. He, 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 boxing is a mercenary sport. You have to get what you can get. But that's a model, and on top of that, 14 fights. That model is unsustainable. Like you are, Heyman is burning through the cash that Fox is giving him right now, almost as quickly as he's burning through the cash that Waldell and Reed gave him. The model is unsustainable. Well, maybe it's not unsustainable though if these guys keep on taking these little paychecks, because they're the ones taking it. And it must. Yeah, be, I mean, if you have guys that are taking a thousand dollar paychecks, or you know, and you can fill up a card, I mean. Okay. That is, in a way, is it sustainable? It's sustainable if you can. No, it's sustainable if the gate is right. If the gate is full, like look at look at the crowd. But but look at the just, crowd. Just that wasn't that that's a, for a minute, right. You're saying that they may have paid the fare for them to come through anyway, so they still get a thousand dollars in their pockets. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't seem like it's a thousand dollars they robbed them, but it looks like it's a thousand dollars they actually get in their hands. So in a way, these guys who would never have gotten that chance with their record get a chance to face a no name. On top of that, get a little pocket change. I can't say anything for Piano. Piano, I, 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 honestly, I don't know why he's getting paid so little. Exactly. It's something that has to be fixed. Listen, it's something that has to be fixed in a way where I can agree with it. If it's a pack house, because you can make much more on the gate, you get more under the table money from the gate. But when it's a half filled stub hub center, think about that. The stub hub center was not half even full. half filled. That's not even half full. That place oh, yeah. holds like like maybe eighty six hundred, and you know if there's fifteen hundred people there, that's not even close to half. Yeah. So that that what did I tell you? Like that game was in terrible. That. For all intents and purposes, I would not be surprised if that car turns out to be a business loss. Like the main thing that's saving them is the right. fact that two million people were watching it. So that but saves them in the money, the money revenue, but the gate revenue is what it's a lot of times there's a lot of fighters and entertainers. That's what they count on most of anything is the gate what, money. What they should have done though is they have another card there in April, early April. I think Danny Garcia and Granados. They should have combined those cards and you know for whatever date in March or April, and then you know they probably would have done better numbers. But that card's probably going to end up having fourteen fights on it too. A mm. uh, quick word on this, George, before we uh, move on. Just a reconfirmation on how much did Mansoor make? Um, twenty five. Mansoor made twenty five k. Um, Ajogba made eight k for that fight. That's why Piano, Piano getting five 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 k just don't make no sense. That's, That's what I'm case. saying, and and it, and it and it goes to show at least how Mansoor just keeps showing up on Fox <laughs> as, as as many times as we've seen him lose, um, and and still is still get these opportunities. I mean. It, it, and and that's that's who grosses more. I, I mean, and this was that fight took place 
what was it? The middle of the day, I believe. I don't think there was anybody even in, in the crowd. I mean, yet the, there wasn't many people to show up when the event, at least the main event, took place as is. Um, but I mean, it almost had that like, like four four p.m. undercard feel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you well, know what I mean. Well, when you're in the when you're in Southern California, and, and Jacob can back me up on this, you know, a lot of those cards do start at four four thirty five o'clock, especially as it you know we get off past the daylight saving time change and it um they start a little bit later at that point and yeah there are often only hundreds not thousands of people in the seats early that that's fairly normal um you know and the family friends you know supporters show up i mean you can hear every single conversation in the place if you're sitting at StubHub. um and I've been to plenty of fights like that in Vegas, too, where the first two, three, four fights, hardly anyone there. I watched Devin Haney's Las Vegas debut in the MGM Grand with maybe 500 people sitting in the stands, and 100 of them were there to see him. Mm. So I love that. Honestly, that's one of the most charming things about being ringside at a, at a card is to go in there when it's practically empty and see these guys. But... When you're getting down to the main events and the televised events and there's nobody in the stands and they've got to play around with the camera angles so it isn't so obvious that the stands yeah, are Yeah, they got to turn out the lights and it's just the lighting. Just, oh, some, well, that's the it's failure, the time that's of, the it's failure the time of the promoter. Of right, the, man. Cold, but, man. It's biting. Oh, it is. It's cold. You know, and I, okay, everybody laughs about us, you know being such punks, weather punks out here in Southern California. But by the time of the main event, it's in the low 50s. That is too cold. That's cold for those guys. They got to be yeah. plenty warmed up, yeah. right? So who knows if that affected Porter? I mean, he trains in Vegas. It's, you know. Dirty. Yeah, was there more people at the top rank uh, Scott Quigg, uh, Oscar Valdez fight when it was you know raining? What? There was, and it was pouring. It yeah. was pouring <laughs> wow. rain. But people, you know, probably a about 2,500, 3,000 people stuck that one out. And a lot of people went upstairs to the standing room only um, area because there was cover. Most of the media hightailed it up to the photographer's perch. There's a pretty good covered press section. A lot of people went up there. But a lot of folks just said, you know, F it. It's raining. That's the deal. They handed out free, clear plastic ponchos. People put them on and said, I'm taking it in and this is it. And I I'm just going to have bragging rights forever that I sat it out. And they were rewarded with that great Valdez quick fight, mm -hmm. you know, so good I mean, for them. And, and speaking of that fight, I mean, now I'm just thinking about it overall, just at the entirety of the event. I mean, considering what was going into this fight, I was rather, um, I guess, somewhat excited looking forward to the fight just because of Ugas and and knowing that he's at least what type of style he was going to bring forward and at least he could really create a you know one of those stub hub classics you know what i mean at least in given where it's taken place um and i was just a tremendously well, you, let down by that at least think so. that, was especially, that kind of got put on the back burner just how disappointing especially the way was. porter normally fights but you know it's funny we talked about this you know porter's loss to kel brook happened there at StubHub. I mean, that was a stunner. You could have yeah. heard a pin drop when Jimmy Lennon said, and the new, and it meant Kel Brook had beaten him. So I, I'm i telling you, I think there's a curse on Porter at that place. He should never darken the door over there again. <laughs> um, let's let's move on to talk about some other fights. Uh, the aforementioned um, F.A. Jabba. I'll go to you, Daniel, on this one. We talked about him a bit last week. Um, he fought um, uh, Mansoor, uh, had his way with him, stopped him in two rounds. I know it's Amir Mansoor, 41 years old, but let's talk about Ajabba right quick. How would you compare him to the other prominent heavyweights out there? Uh, Joe Joyce, Dubois, uh, Tony Yoka, who's currently in sus is suspended right now. Um, the Croatian heavyweight, um, Hrvacic, um, Junior Fla, who we talked about last week, uh, based on what you saw, what you've seen from um, Ajabba, 
uh, your thoughts about him and how did, how does he compare? Uh, first things first, uh, we should not call that a fight. We should just call that a mugging. Yeah, too big and too strong and too young. Yeah, that's a mugging. And in all reality, Mansoor hasn't been the same since he bit his tongue against Brazil. And like I said, he hasn't been the same sense. But as far as looking into the how Jabi is as a fighter, the comparison that a lot of people give to him just because of mainly his frame is Deontay Wilder. That he's a little bit on the skinny side for the division, but he does pack a decent punch. Right now at this stage, he's a, he's a more uh, compared to the other one. He's obviously the more polished of the two. That yes, and and that's definitely going to come into effect the fact that Ronnie Shields is your trainer. So you get a you get a little bit more variety in your training and a little bit more in your arsenal based on that. The kids got a long way to go though because uh, it's one thing just to find guys like Mansoor who. Never really were contenders. They were like close to the periphery, but never really got to that level. And it's another thing to get to like the Yokas and the Joyces, to the Bois in that area. <coughs> I have to give him probably two or three years because he'll start developing this fight. He'll start going into these rounds because the same thing is the same thing with. As Wilder is, he was able to knock for a while. Remember, Wilder never until what thirty plus fights he didn't go past the fourth round. And as long as it, this kind of job, it could be the same case because he's knocking people out so early. He has to face it. You have to give him two or three more years. You have to see how he can last in different rounds, like in long rounds. And luckily for him, the division's young enough where there's enough young guys. That could give him that test. He's like, like I said, he's a good prospect. I just would give, I just would give him a while though, because a lot of first round knockouts. Yes, he is the guy who, like we mentioned last week, the guy who his opponent literally walked away from the first bell. But you got to give him time, two or three more years, and then we'll then we'll see what he's made of. Because by then. Like I said, Wilder will be older. Joshua may be in his prime or getting close to being out of his prime. And most of the other guys like Joyce, Yoka, Dubois may already be on the, on the contender side. Um, This between uh, Ajaba and Mansoor took a place on the undercard of Porter and Ugas. The same night as this uh, PBC card, there was a design card um, as well. Uh, going to you on this one, uh, what you need. The main event of the design card was uh, Dimitri Bivol defending his uh, the BA light heavyweight title against one Joe Smith. Uh, Bivol won by clear cut decision, unanimous. But uh, there were a couple moments in there that were a little bit shaky for Bivol, round four, and particularly at the end of round 10 when he was buzzed. Round 10, he was wobbly, I felt, going back to his corner. Uh, but uh, Bivol, he showed me something in that last round, what you need. He closed the show like a champ, had Joe Smith uh, buzzed a bit on the ropes, um, had him backing up. Uh, your overall impressions of the fight your, on Bivol, any concerns that he got clipped and caught and, and, and buzzed a bit in that fight? Your thoughts? Man, I'm, I'm highly impressed by Bivol. He really, I really like him. I like, I like his style. By the way, he also hurt Joe Smith. That's why Joe Smith started backing up. Yes. I don't remember that. In the ninth round, we caught him with a left hook. And the dude was going down, and somehow he managed to stay up. And then he I caught him in, I think, eight rounds, eight and nine, by way of left hooks. And like I said, he showed and what he did in the last round as well. He um, hurt him again. I think from round one, he dictated the pace. Joe Smith was the guy that threw the first jab and stuff. But then Joe Smith realized... <laughs> when Bebo started landing those combos on him in the first round, I think he realized I can't just walk through this guy. But he did he did let it loose in round 11. And then some of round 12, he really tried to go at Bebo. 
and people just let him, you know, he was just letting him, you know, slip in and done. And then people just crashed him in the final 30 minutes, 30 seconds of the round. He just started crashing it, you know. And I, I felt like this is just a feeling. I felt like Bevo could have gotten him out of there at any time if he wanted to push the action. But I think he wanted to be more intelligent, play safe. He was the smaller fighter in there, right? He's, he really is not that big a, a light heavyweight. So he got clipped in the 10th, I think it was, the end of the 10th. And, yeah, he did stagger to his corner, and he realized that. And Joe Smith realized that, too, and went for Gusto in round 11. Um, but Bevo got good defense and stuff. And so, um, but, no, I wasn't concerned for Bevo because he's just, he's very smart. And what he was trying to do at a certain point, even though he was initiating, he was first or most of the time. He was trying to get Joe Smith Jr. to open up so he could clock him. But Joe Smith Jr. tasted something in round one. And he was like, nah, I ain't doing that. <laughs> so, because so, Joe Smith, he was too slow for Bevo. You understand? He was way too slow. Bevo, the, the way how Bevo punches is what I like. I find he's even smoother than Lomachenko. He is so natural with the punches. He doesn't, he doesn't force anything. He doesn't tense up. So when he throws a punch, you get the weight of the punch. And he's so accurate. He's so damn accurate with his punches that you go, even if he didn't throw it with a whole bunch of power behind it, it it's placed so well that he, you, you have to respect him. You understand? And, and he, could put it, he could put some heat behind it. You saw him put some heat on, uh, 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 on some of those punches when he wanted to crash. He thought he could have crashed Joe Smith Jr., but then he realized, no, nah, I can't crash him. He got sloppy against the ropes. That's why Joe Smith Jr. caught him with that wing and right hook at the end of the round. He got a little sloppy, you know, because he had to stay focused straight through the fight, you know. But, yeah, I was impressed by Bevo. I am impressed by him for a long time because he's not a guy who has one punch knockout power. He uses his boxing skill to actually get you out of there. He breaks you down and he gets you out of there. So, um, and he has these unusual combinations I've never seen before. So, I really like what he did. I like how smart he is. It's the same thing he did with Pascal. He didn't try and go go at, go with a war at Pascal. Pascal was trying to set traps. He didn't bite it. And the same thing with Joe Smith Jr. He won't he won't just bite it. But once you let your guard down or you just throw you finish throwing a punch, he can hit you a three punch combination because you're open in various spots on your body. So he can hit you a left hook to the body. He could come back with a right hook to your head or a right hook to your chin or overhand right across your guard or across your jab. You know, I like how he, he puts these combinations together. He did a three-punch combination. And all of the on, on, on accurate, like accurate combinations to accurate spots on your body. Never seen, I, not, I never quite seen that before, you know? And I like how, and there's another thing I like about Bebo. Bebo doesn't, Bebo will just touch you. Like he wouldn't, he's not a guy who would put his full weight behind a punch all the time. Sometimes he just touch you with a punch, just to say, I can hit you here. And then the next time, he can put some oomph behind it and hit you hard, so you feel it. So every time he now touches you, you feel you're wincing to make sure that you, he does, you don't get hit. So even a touch feels like if he's hitting you hard. So you respect him that much at the end of the day. It's very psychological. So I really like In short, he varies the intensity of his punches, so it makes it hard to read. Absolutely. He's, he's all about shock factor. So when you are not expecting a punch, that's when he's going to line a punch on you. Kind of like Andre Ward or Floyd. He's, he's not predictable. He's never predictable. And that's what keeps him ahead of the game with these guys. Bigger guys than him. These are bigger guys than people. A uh, quick follow-up question before I move on. 75 is heating up right now with Kovalev regaining the title. You got Gavostik. You got Brown. Uh, so there's potential to make – you got um, Berta Beav as well. You got potential for big fights at 75 for Bivol, but he's also talked about fighting at 168, and you just mentioned how he's not a big a light heavyweight. You're right. Uh, Joe Smith Jr. looked the full division bigger for him. Yeah. Smith at 168, even a Canelo. Where you know, do you think he will go? Do you think he will stay and seek the big fight at 75, or do you think if there's an opportunity there, particularly if there's money involved, for him to move down to 168? If Canelo wants to fight him, of course he's gonna abandon everything and fight Canelo. I mean, that's money right there. But if he, if 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 not, a good seventy-five fight for him is Badu Jack. Badu Jack's not a big seventy-five pounder either. He's small, so that's a good that's a good one. 
Um, I would love to see, honestly, I would like to see Bevo versus Govardic. And I would like to see Kovalev versus, um, what's his name? Bitter yeah. Beef or Bitter, Brown? Yeah, Bitter Beef. Bitter yeah, Beef. That's what I want to see. I want Bitter Beef versus Kovalev because I, I know they faced each other in the amateurs. I would like to see Gabordic versus Bevo. That's what I'd love to see. Mm. I'm going to go to you. Okay, go to you, Gail. Uh, uh, on the undercard here, uh, we mentioned how Sean Porter had issues uh, making the weight. So did Maurice Hooker. Um, Hooker making the second defense of his WBO uh, super lightweight title, uh, fighting a, a New Yorker, local New Yorker by the name of uh, Les Pierre. Well, not local New Yorker, New York transplant by the name of Les Pierre. Um, given the struggles he had making the weight, Gail, I was fairly impressed by Hooker. Um, he controlled things on the outside and inside. Um, I liked the body work that he employed Hooker at moments throughout the fight. Uh, Dominant win by Maurice Hooker. Talk about the fight, but with the news of Ramirez talking about him wanting unification fights, uh, where do you see Hooker going? Do you think after this, given this news, that Hooker will try to, and his team will try to seek a unification bout with um, Juan Ramirez? Well, first of all, Hooker didn't miss weight by much. He only originally missed weight by a quarter pound. Now, he missed okay it's you know close and horseshoes and hand grenades and all that so he did come back uh you know after getting his two hours he made it barely uh is that another indication of a guy you know having trouble making weight maybe uh, but it wasn't the same sort of trouble uh that sean porter had i mean this, this is razor thin um hooker is still under 30 barely he'll turn 30 in august right so you know in his late 20s here's what i'm impressed about with maurice hooker i have to tell you after having seen him fight darlis perez um in las vegas um a couple years ago you know that was supposed to be this big coming out party for him he barely eked out a split decision and it was a gift let me tell you it was a gift that was he got his first minor little and ABO continental this or that Cracker Jack title. And I was, I was thoroughly unimpressed with him, thoroughly unimpressed. To his credit, he went back and worked and worked. He, his next fight, he took a fight in Tijuana um, to just work on, on his craft. And he, he went up against an old veteran banger and he learned. And then he fought another guy and he learned and then he got Terry Flanagan and pulled that out. You know what? Every fight he has, despite the fact that he's in his late twenties, almost 30 years old, he's improving every single fight. And here we were in late 2016 being told how great he was and he stunk up the joint. You know, he's finally grown. It's kind of like he's, grown into his shoes or gloves finally you know he is finally realizing all the hype and all the promise there was for him a couple of years ago he did a terrific job admittedly his opponent despite the fact he had an undefeated record was you know more or less a paper tiger although give le pierre credit he absolutely made the most of his opportunity with you know admittedly some limited skills he gave it his best effort. He kept coming at Hooker. So it made for a fun fight to watch. And it was really a good performance. So, and Hooker blew it out on the scorecards. The scorecards were 120 to 107, <laughs> 119 to 108, and 118 to 109. I mean, that is a blowout, okay? Um, and yeah, now it's time for him to really test himself with a unification fight. If, if he can get Ramirez, I, man, I'm all for it. Good for you. The clock is ticking. He is going to be 30 years old. If he wants to reign as a champion and test himself, um, good for him. He absolutely should. I do think he's finally ready to do so. And he's been gaining fans um, from the hardcore like me who didn't think much of him back in the you know late 2016 um, to those of us who've kind of come around. 
here's the question. Can he still continue to make 140? Is he going to turn the corner to 30 and struggle to make weight? That's That, to me, is the one problem he might have to solve. And, you know, if he has to capitulate and go up to welterweight, that could be very interesting. We are not exactly at the strongest field in the welterweight division. You know, Terrence Crawford aside, everybody else is kind of on this interesting level below him. I mean, arguably, the best fighter in the division other than Terrence Crawford is Manny Pacquiao. And, you know, no disrespect to Pacquiao, but I can't believe we're saying that in 2019. Hooker might want to give it some thought, depending on how he really feels at 140. Mm, mm, mm. One more fight we're going to talk about, going to the UK. Uh, Fame Royal um, Albert Hall, going to you on this one, George. Uh, Anthony Yard, number one contender for Sergey Kovalev's uh, title at 175, fought a fighter by the name of Travis Reeves. Yard had his way throughout, but I think I saw a Facebook post um, on a boxing channel where you noticed a flaw in Yard. So talk about that and talk about what he had to say in the aftermath uh, when asked about possibly fighting um, Kovalev, he kind of gave a kind of a conflicting answer where on the one hand he said, yeah, if offered, he would take it. But uh, you have that's why you have a team. And in the end, while he said he would take it in the end, it seemed to suggest he and his team is not in, that, in not that much of a hurry to fight the crusher. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> quite a bit of. Um... I guess the subtext there and, and some of his answers really. Um, Anthony Yard has been for, for, I would say, at least for the better part of the past year, uh, been uh, a pr pretty, uh, pretty decent talent coming out of the UK, promising talent um, that a lot of people have been keeping their eye on. Um, and he's been pretty much blowing through his opposition, um, pretty much all domestic level uh, UK. Um, UK level for the most part. Um, he's uh, pretty much now, um, at least at his, as far as titles, we, you would say he's um, he's currently carrying carrying sorry carrying the WBO Intercontinental Lightweight Championship. Um, so that's pretty much those you know for the most part. If you're uh, you know you're knocking on the door as a contender, you're still going to parade that belt around, even though it's not the real thing. Um, and, and, you know, they definitely seem to, you know, get somewhat of a kick out of it. It's definitely a boost for his confidence. Um, and, and he is somewhat of a charismatic, some, somewhat charismatic type of guy, which, uh, plays, it, it plays as a double-edged sword for him. Um, with these guys, like I said, he, he's blowing through this guy with little to no amateur, uh, background at all. Um, and with that, that's part of the reason why there was at least some hesitation in, uh, in Anthony Yard after the fight. Um, Travis Reed, you know, this is um, pretty much just part of the course, really, for his past opponents. Um, aging, um, I'm sorry, yeah, aging American fighter. Um, wasn't really expected to do much. Um, but in the essence, at least somewhat still gave, actually, I would say the best performance um, even that considered of, uh, of anyone he's fought yet, at least was came in to actually come in and fight, not actually just to, uh, see what Anthony the yards powers like. And like, uh, okay, I'll check out here at this point in time. You know, those, those type of fights are always annoying, uh, especially for those develop developing fighters. Um, so, so that being said, there's nothing necessarily really to take out of the fight. Um, what I did notice, um, in his game, um, and, and usually this does happen with, you know, obviously fighters who don't necessarily have the fundamental background is that um, they, they, they stick to one thing that compensates for the other. So um, pretty much like the, the autopsy of what Roy Jones career was uh, once he retired was uh, things that the, you know, they noticed was like, oh, well, he never necessarily had a jab. Um, and later on it affected him once he lost his, you know, his reaction abilities and things like that. Uh, and, and, and things like that will carry over to fighters who don't necessarily have that background. They kind of just create what works for them. Um, and, and with that, 
you know, you're seeing Anthony Yard create some some specific habits. Um, I don't know. I think you're maybe referring to maybe my post I mentioned while I was um, I just a little bit. Of, I guess you could say live tweeting, but with Facebook um, during most fights. And uh, and he is just considerably open for the right hand almost at all times. Uh, he keeps his left hand tremendously low. Uh, and, and and for given what it was, I mean, and for this fight, um, speaking of his left hand, uh, pretty decent jab he actually did use to, to the effect, uh, one thing to note on. Um, but it is just considerably low. And even when anything comes over, uh, some over that side, he's totally relying on either uh, his reaction uh, or for at least for him to totally move out in time. It, it, it almost just coincidental really. And he's uh, and that's, that is not going to fly when he's looking for the likes, when he was barking up the tree of uh, Sergei Kovalev, who given, yes, he's a shadow of what he was, but um, you know, he's, he's still, he's still top tier and uh, sure. He wouldn't, he, he would be, <laughs> he would love the chance to bring back Crusher uh, w with an opportunity to land a right hand like that over over uh, Anthony Yard. And and to that point, uh, when it was asked for him uh, on as far as challenging, because again, this was a major uh, talking point coming into the fight. Uh, because Anthony Yard, I mean, I'm sure you you saw his, uh, I believe it was his tweet or Instagram post. Where he he's outright calling out Kovla, um, so just the fact that he's totally whistling a different tune uh, when it's talking about you know um, actually and, and that's the funny thing at least to note too was was how Kovla even got brought up into the conversation and was I was expecting because even the reporter was given the opportunity to call out Kovla he was like well you know is there anyone in particular that you want to fight or is anything that you're looking up to, you know, as far as these, uh, you know, to stepping up, uh, in competition, uh, Sergey Kovalev comes to mind. Uh, Oh yeah. You know, that's, you know, that's what the teams are for, but if it comes, it comes, but you know, I mean, just the, the, yeah. the passiveness that I just is just starkly different. Um, and you know, and we, you know, I already do a bad, bad job of, uh, just doing, you know, just play conspiracy theorists, but um, I'm. That's. I just found it weird that you go from just, just one shade to the other, um, and especially come. It's not like he came off a performance where he really did that bad. I mean, he he, he looked good. I mean, he did did what he was supposed to. Um, I just spotted that that opening just because I I, I saw it there and. Uh, um, and Reeves, to his credit, I mean, was land. It did land actually two two pretty decent shots, two decent right hands. Um, and and at least that, that's maybe why I noticed that uh, that overhand right per se. But I even noticed some other people who commented on that thread that continued like, "Oh yeah, I mean, if you can see, he's you know, does other things like this, or I mean, not certain uppercuts and inside fighting, he's you know, he's a little bit, you know, um, can easily be tangled up a little bit to." Uh, uh, yeah, to try to throw back and, and, and you know up close and things like that. So, uh, credit you know him and his trainer pretty much are all doing this on the fly. So I never like to credit people um, who are especially willing to you know t take this sport that serious to just wanting to jump in like that. Um, and I appreciate it when they actually do take the the preparation of the sport seriously. And I think that's maybe why some people are a little bit more frustrated when the likes of Deontay Wilder because it's almost like he kind of he kind of bask in that boxing ignorance. You know what I mean? Um, it doesn't necessarily want to try to improve on that. He kind of just is like, Hey, look, I got power and it is what it is, you know, but it, you know, Anthony yard is, you know, someone who is trying to develop in the sport. Um, and his trainer does, you know, make that point in, in, in the fact that, you know, Hey, look, we want to develop this guy, you know, and this is the light heavyweight division. You know, it, it, it's, there's some bangers up here and, and and I think I actually even made a post out to this. It was it wasn't like a um, anything like subliminal or anything like that. But I, I I think I just made a poll of like, would anyone as a boxing fan would they be turned off uh, by an, a prospect stating that he's not ready for a specific fight or he's not ready necessarily to step up? And overwhelmingly, 
every single person except one of uh, probably just a troll was like, hey, look, no, I'd absolutely have no issue with a fighter uh, saying that they weren't ready. And um, and I think what Anthony Yard is getting caught up with with that charisma is that he's kind of boasting himself as, you know, being, you know, this big beast, the lion, you know, lions in the camp is his, his fucking phrasing. Like, I just find really annoying and dumb. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and that's, that's you know, that's that's what he, you know, amps himself up on. And when you're going around saying that, and as like I already noticed, it's annoying to me. So imagine, you know, those fans who are like, all right, you know, who are you? You know, what, what are you doing? You know, like, are you are you serious? But are you are you, you know, are you just talking shit? And and that's what this at least with the UK sentiment that that's pretty much where. I would say most of us really are at at this point. So if he's he, he <laughs> the hesitation is it and it doesn't seem to uh, too great for us as optimists. Um, but I mean, considering what we're seeing, it's undeniable that he's, it's time for him to, to, to start going for, uh, you know, some, I would say world-class competition, really. I mean, indeed, if he's ranked that high, uh, he's going to have to fight. He's going to have to prove that ranking. He just can't sit on it, uh, because eventually people's going to, uh, call him out and you know kind of pull his card a bit and so uh, and i think it's maybe pointed in the fact that he's calling out kovalev specifically who's no longer really the boogeyman of the division really uh more or less i say the wounded tiger really so maybe what does that say i guess that kind of just sounds like uh you know just trying to chomp at the old lion you know what indeed, I mean? indeed indeed let's move on to some news here i'm going to you uh I'm going to you first, Gail, and then you can follow up, Jacob, since, uh, Gail, you was paying attention to this. We've talk, we have talked about it a few weeks ago that it was word that Ganana Golovkin was on the verge of signing a deal with Dazan. Well, it is official now. He did sign a deal with Dazan, uh, had a press conference uh, this week. We covered it, Gail. Uh, any highlights of that press conference in terms of uh, Dazan's side as well as Triple G side? Well, of course, it wasn't exactly a secret by the time they came out to do the formal announcement and, and talk about it, but they did gather the media out of Southern California. Uh, we got to watch the players interact with each other and, of course, answer various other questions about their interests. The bottom line for Golovkin is he's gotten a three-year, six-fight deal with Dazong, but what was of greater interest to him long-term is to also ink an agreement with his own GGG, Triple G Promotions uh, company to get uh, a guaranteed two-card promotion on the zone in 2020. Sounds a long way away, but that's next year. So he gets two cards with the zone in 2020, two cards guaranteed in 2021. That means he, as a promoter, can put these cards on the zone with whatever stable he starts building up as a promoter. And this is where he wants to take his career once he retires from the ring. So he's thinking very long-term business and building this business uh, relationship with Dazong. That is apparently what took the length of time for him to sign on. And as executive chairman John Skipper of Dazon said, you know, this is somebody making decisions essentially for the rest of their life as an athlete and for potentially the rest of their life, you know, beyond that in the sport. So you don't rush into that quickly. And he's absolutely right. I, I get it that the fans were anxious, but you're inking a deal like that. You want to take time. And we have to also remember the dirty lens that Golovkin personally looks at these deals through. You know, he went to the Olympics and got screwed out of a gold medal, which everyone readily admits now, 15 years later, yeah, he got screwed, okay? So that's your introduction to this, you know, to the high levels of the sport. Great. I mean, a lot of people would say an Olympic silver medal is not a bad thing, but he, it should be gold. Then he toiled along, rising up the ranks, prop, you know, being promised year after year after year, yeah, 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 you're going to get the 
big opponents and he didn't. And his promoter kept promising a, you know, uh, the moon and didn't give it to him while they were uh, kissing ass of Felix Sturm. And he waited him out, waited him out until he finally just had to dump them at nearly age 30 and start all over again, essentially at the bottom in the United States, you know, and he probably recognizes he waited way too long to do that, unfortunately. So this is going to be one cautious dude when entering into business. Oh, and if you haven't read this, let's just pile this on. He's apparently engaged in some legal battle with his two former managers, also both Germans. So, and I'm not talking about his promoter, Loeffler, and forget all the rumors you heard. Loeffler is still his promoter. The reason he wasn't in Los Angeles is he was at a funeral, okay? So everyone can calm down. Um, so normally, so you know, it was normal. In fact, it, it, it's the smart thing for the man to do to be very cautious about his business dealings. So he'll get a tune-up fight in June. He, of course, is saying big things about, you know, going to be a top five guy, top 10 guy. I'm not sure that's exactly true. There are some rumors about him fighting an undefeated Polish middleweight that none of us know in the United States. So stay tuned, but there will be a fight in June. He was going back to training camp as of today. So he'll be ready. Uh, whether Canelo comes along in a third fight, that certainly seems to be the plan. When still up in the air and Let's all remind ourselves, Canelo does have to beat Danny Jacob here in another two months. And that is not exactly 100% assured. Nothing is assured in boxing. So we'll see that down the road. And certainly that was a draw for DAZN. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, there is a lot of potential for him in the middleweight division, but I think it is entirely likely that Golov can has a couple at least of those six fights he's contractually obligated to at 168. And the guy, one of the guys who's very, very interested in him potentially at 168 is Dimitri Bivol. Bivol can easily go to 168. He will do it for a big enough fight. And everyone thinks he means Canelo. I personally think he'll fight Golovkin before he fights Canelo if it's going to happen. Um, it's very feasible for Bevel to do it. He has said this multiple times. If you look at Bevel standing there against Joe Smith, Joe Fish, Joe Smith dwarfed him. Bevel is a, is a small light heavyweight if there is such a thing. He doesn't even need to try to make weight because he walks around Easily under 175. I mean, with dude, no he's, effort. He, eats the, he, eat, he eats before he eats breakfast. Before I the day have, in. and full disclosure, most people who listen to this podcast know I have work, done work for main events and specifically with B Ball and his team. I personally have seen B Ball eating breakfast the day of a weigh in, two hours before. He doesn't even sweat it. So he would have to work to get to 168. But the man has terrific work ethic. It wouldn't take much of a trim down. Just have a few less potatoes at, you know, a few meals. And I think he'd make 168 just fine. And he's just, he's a very slight six feet tall. So 168, I think would hang very nicely on him. And Bivol would be a very formidable opponent for Golovkin. Frankly, I think he'd be Golovkin's worst nightmare. I don't think I'd want to touch it if I was Golovkin, unless it was really big money and it was maybe one of the last couple of fights of his career. Um, to me, the most interesting thing Golovkin said, um, other than talking about the, the deal itself, is he, he was asked whether he still pr is pressing for unification of all the belts in the middleweight division. You know, for years we've heard him saying, I want all the belts. I want all the belts. And Canelo had held that but WC, WBC belt hostage for a long time. I want all the belts. Okay. He's not saying that anymore. He's saying, well, it's not really about the belts. What, what it's about is getting the best fights and, and being the best. And the best fights are not always about the belts. And the best fighters don't always have the belts. 
very and it's also about the money let's be honest well of course it is um and it's his legacy and it's you know he doesn't want to screw around with politics and he also alluded to that a little bit so i think we're going to see some very different decision making about who the opponents are um i think he'd rather have a fan friendly fill the seats action-packed fight than necessarily a fight for a title at this point of his career very very interesting we're going to have to watch in the next year to see how this approach plays out but there was really very little other direction he could go than going with design now turning to john skipper who's the essentially the ceo of design they call him the executive chairman which just rings really strange to me john skipper made it pretty clear that yeah design's been spending a lot of money and they intend to keep spending a lot of money whatever it takes they're going to get everyone in their stable they want whatever it takes and the guy whose name came up don't spoil uh, it oh we won't go there uh, okay. we're yeah, going to talk about we're going to talk later in the podcast i'm sure about what john skipper revealed about what's going on behind the scenes next for design now that they've signed golovkin he immediately got on a plane and he's one busy guy Stay tuned and we'll keep talking about that. Yeah, don't spoil it. We're going to talk a uh, quick work reaction to uh, uh, not only the signing of Design, uh, Jacob, but the kind of combo deal in terms of not just the rest of his professional career, but also uh, uh, the business portion uh, that was also involved in his signing as well, Jacob. I mean, I think this goes back to, you know, what Oscar De La Hoya was able to do, um, you know, he was part of the biggest pay-per-views. He started his own promotion company and, you know, Mayweather did, you know, something similar and, you know, Kodo's trying to do something similar. So like all these guys that were names um, that were putting, you know, that were popular fighters, they see that there can be life after boxing, um, you know, especially if you're from an area like Golovkin is where, you know, we're getting a lot of those, uh, um, Russian or, or Eastern Bloc fighters uh, coming out of that can be competitive, you know, and whether it's in the amateurs and then transitioning to pros. So, you know, that's really, I think, where where they kind of get to the end of their career and don't end up someone like someone like uh, Brandon Rios, right? Where all he knows to do is fight. He's probably not going to be a trainer. He's probably not going to be a promoter. So, he ends up coming back to, you know, get his ass kicked, you know, for another fight, you know, because he, he doesn't know how to do anything else. Um, so it's a smart move on his part to see, you know, that the, the, it is a business that he can, you know, he can fight on if he wants to. I personally think that he should retire, but, you know, he wants to get a couple more fights in. You know, he... He gets them in, he gets paid, and then he can transition this into, you know, hopefully more, uh, you know, lucrative uh, future money where he's not, you know, he's paying people to, to get their brains beat in and, and just doing the promotions. So, um, you know, he's, he's a likable guy. You know, he's, you know, he seems to have a, a really, you know, good personality. So, um, you know, it, it's all good for him. You know, hopefully other boxers kind of take note of this and are able to, you know, do, you know, think about what, what you do after, after, you know, your, your box. By the way, let me just add, um, offline and some of the interviews and discussions, uh, of all people, Abel Sanchez, his trainer made it very clear that he and Golovkin intend to troll the 2020 Olympics for potential young talent. And they're going to scour Kazakhstan, and some of the other Eastern European small former Soviet republics for talent. And they are talking about, you know, youngsters that they can train from the ground up, the young teenagers looking for a chance. So he wants to try to corner the market. To date, Agus Klimas, um, working out of Oxnard, has been the one scooping all these guys up. So I think Golovkin wants to get into competition with Agus for the next Lomachenko and the next Gavazdik. That, that will that would be very interesting to watch and it's actually it's it goes even beyond that it's like you know like what oscar did you know like he he you know he's of mexican descent and so he you know he targeted you know the and it's 
it's an easier sell when you, you know, you have somebody that's, you know, been a champion and, you know, made it from, you know, the Olympics to, um, you know, to the level that they are now. So then it's kind of like, oh yeah, this is like one of my countrymen. So I want to sign up with this guy. Yeah, so, but absolutely. I don't, I think, I think the better strategy though, is not to look for the next, you know, Lomachenko or, or, you know, things like that, but to get a group, uh, get a good stable, you know, people that aren't going to be maybe necessarily, you know, they can be champions, but you want to have more of them, not just, you know, have one person in your stable because golden boy, you know, for, I, I do believe that they're the weaker of the three um, major promotion companies because their stable isn't that deep. I mean, they have Canelo, but like without Canelo, I don't really know that they would be, you know, ringing in the dough. Um, well, the truth know. is Jacob, they have tons of fighters, but the problem is it's expensive to maintain all those guys and promote them. And that's the problem. Canelo, if they didn't have Canelo bringing in the money, there's no way they could afford to maintain all of these other guys that they're trying to develop. You know, they always hope, for example, that Joseph Diaz Jr. would be at a point by now to be making big money. But, you know, Jojo, much as I like him, his career is stalled a bit. Same with guys like Joette Gonzalez. And, you know, the only one way under the radar right now, Ryan Garcia, of course, they're hoping he's the next Canelo. I think their next Canelo is going to be Virgil Ortiz Jr., but that's another story. But there's tons of them. So they have to be a little cautious about where their investment goes in these younger guys. I'm not sure volume is the best strategy, but but they will. But you are right. I don't think there's any intention of putting all their eggs in one basket. They'll bring over a dozen, a dozen and a half guys and start a big factory going on and hope that one of them does become the next Lomachenko. Yeah, next but I, I, for that I, matter. Think, I, I do think it is a mistake though to try to be try to get the. Um, the next, you know, like Floyd Mayweather, or whatever. I, I think Floyd May Mayweather, for an example, is like a one of a kind, you know, commodity that doesn't come around very often. So, you know, if you're hoping to catch catch that big white well, I think that's a, that's that's the biggest risk because you you never really know how that's going to pan out. But if you can well, build your stable and you know at least you know even if these guys are losing but they're in competitive fights and exciting fights and getting people to to want to see them, I think that that can do better for your, your total, like, you know, promotion company in the long run. Okay. Let's move on to, uh, Gail almost spoiled it, but, uh, she mentioned that during the, uh, Golovkin press conference behind the scenes, uh, Skipper, um, of the zone talked about, he's not finished in terms of trying to sign prominent names. And I'll go to you on this one, Daniel, you can follow up George. Uh, one of the guys that Skipper was referring to was, uh, one Deontay Wilder, uh, where it is, is that, uh, there's a meeting happening or going to happen with Wilder and Shelly Finkel and representatives from the zone. Uh, give some backstory into that. And, and Wilder may possibly sign after we first heard he may sign with Bob Arum. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it looks like he may sign a, a, a deal with the zone. And if he does, will we finally see him in Anthony Joshua fight? That's the big if. The main thing <clears throat> that's fo that focuses on this fight is the fact that for all intents and purposes, Wilder, Wilder, his sights are set on two people, Fury and Joshua. That's it. Like, yes, the WBC ordered the mandatory fire Brazil, but we know he doesn't want that. The issue is going to be, though, he realizes, if I have to reach Fury, I have to sign with Bob. But then after Fury, you have this divide in networks-wise where, like I said, I'll, I'll say it again. ESPN has stated that they won't be the ones to stop big fights. However, John Skipper, we have to mention, like, yes, he's the CEO of the zone. He was the president, I think, of ESPN. Uh, his probably his lasting legacy at ESPN, as far as personality, is Dan Levitard. He's the person that brought Dan Levitard to ESPN and has been able to get the success that he has been able to get. The, but unfortunately he did not leave exactly in the best of terms with ESPN with ABC so working that together it's a little bit more difficult than if than fighting for with Fury and then going after Joshua 
the path to the zone is a little bit easier because it's the is the easiest path to Joshua. And Shelly Finko realizes that. Wilder's team realizes that. And at the end of the day, Al Heyman realizes that. So they have to make this effort to actually get the sign a sign the deal, which by the way, this would this would be a huge blow to Showtime. It's a Fury signing with Top Rank was already a big blow to Showtime to begin with. This would be the ultimate block because then they have nobody at heavyweight. Nobody major at heavyweight. And uh, it could well shoot, that could possibly freeze Showtime out. <laughs> if that happens, they could they they could end up uh doing what HBO did and, and fold boxing wise. It's well long term. Long term that can actually happen, but that's because of different reasons. Like I've always said, like I mentioned one of the reasons why HBO went out of business was because they decided to throw a truckload of money at Bill Simmons. Showtime did the same thing. They just didn't do it to a sports figure. They did it to D'Souza Merrill. And they're doing that money, although they're probably going to save some money with uh, them canceling that Smith series for bad, really bad reasons. But the thing with it when it comes to Showtime is they need to go into pay-per-view fights and they need things to happen for them to be able to make it a marketable fight. But right now, Al is focusing, Heyman is focusing a lot of things on this Fox deal. And by the way, this is a big blow to Fox too because Deontay Wilder would have been a good Fox pay-per-view deal. Like the fight with Brazil if they don't sign the zone, was set to be a pay-per-view fight because initially it was supposed to be the Fury rematch. So it's an interesting tale. Like I said, it's a very, very interesting story to follow. There's a lot of different parties involved. In, Luda Bella's involved in so because he's been the promoter that has worked most with Deontay Water, even though he's not assigned to promoter. We all know in the day, in the, day the actual promoter is Al Heyman. But it's an admission to the parties is Wilder by himself is not going to make a franchise as far as pay-per-view. Fortunately, he needs a partner. And yeah. and mainly beca and because Tyson Fury, like I said, did not sign the contract. He had no idea what was in it. He just saw big money and just signed it. He nixed one of those plans. So if, you, if you're going for a big money fight, and you're targeting two people, if one person screws up, you might as well go after the other. So it's a good move. It'll it'll be interesting to see how they're going to pair it because it'll be difficult to see if they can make the fight at the end of the year. It'll really, really depend a lot on what Dillian White does because, first of all, Dillian White's not going to be free if... If Wilder's first fight's gonna be with Brazil, then then so be it. Then Brazil has to sign a little deal with Brazil themselves. But I don't think you might probably gonna see the Joshua fight this year. I think you're gonna have Eddie Hearn try to try to throw Dillian White in there uh, again, like just try to offer something to Bob Arum in top rank, saying like, "Look, Dillian." He's the contender. He's this and that. He'll try to do something with it, but they're going to run into the John Skipper issue again. I'm going to you, George. Whether he signed with Aram or uh, signing with Dazon ultimately, and we talked about this on, on your show, on your podcast uh, two, three weeks ago, the bottom line is with Deontay Wilder, he has to make his move from a financial perspective. He needs to make it uh, ASAP. Because given what Joshua doing, he's moving on. Not not moving. Well, moving on is the wrong word. He's he's doing his thing. He's making moves. Uh, whatever you think of Fury's deal with uh, top ranked ESPN, he's making moves. Wilder post fight post Fury fight, he hasn't done anything, and he could be left out the loop as a result. So he has to do something. Yeah, and and that's why. Uh, you have 
Fox and at least Showtime and 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 and, and PBC still trying to really um, at least do what they can to still keep him at least keep him on board. Um, but you know, and 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 we, and we highlighted it like like you mentioned on on the podcast, at least on my show a couple weeks ago. Um, if you if you're looking out for Deontay Wilder's best interest, um, you're probably looking to take at least one of these uh, <clears throat> one of these other deals. Um, it just kind of goes to the point, really, what we were talking about pre-show, uh, which has been the business model of at least what PBC is, which it kind of just seems like it's just a house of favoritism, really. And, uh, and you know, you're more or less paid for your roles. Uh, countless times, I've, if you're just just a main criticism with PBC fighters, uh, it's just that it seems like they're they're overpaid for for little effort and work, uh, or at least, at least as far as the, the shows. I mean, Amir Mansoor is a PBC favorite, it continuously shows up to lose, um, and here he makes almost three times more than the the highlighted prospect on the on the night you know what i mean um and so so again it just goes to the basically the business model really at hand and, and what really what he wants to continue to do and and like you noted with this in mind he's now left in the dark considering here he's one of the two champions actually one of the two one of the three champions actually with a belt uh, I'm sorry. One of the three, one of the top three, should I say, uh, with a belt. And here he's pretty much in the same range as Dillian White. You know, so he has to. I don't. I. I listen. There has to be something, some type of serious personal issue, or something just goes completely off the rails for. A deal with either parties, ESPN or DAZN, if it doesn't work, because the PBC, PBC model, while at least it had great intentions, it's just it is just way too expensive, and by expenses, it just mean just so much expenses just on. Really, it just seems like just money kind of just going out with nothing to come back in. Um, and, and considering that he's, he's got some marketing that he needs to do as is, uh, fuck it. Why not get, get, get some, some exposure fighting more regularly and, and better challenges. Um, and, and then just, it, it, this just broadens, you, you broadens your, basically your whole playing field of what you can actually do. That, that whole range of, oh, you can't fight this guy because of this. Oh, you can't fight this guy, or, you know, because they're over there. You know, all of that goes. And if that seriousness of, of the Anthony Joshua fight down the line is, I mean, this would be a major statement in that pursuit. So I'm almost, it's almost like we're, we're kind of in that Golovkin, the zone signing moment where like, all right, he's got to take the deal. And it, it's almost as if like a full blown conclusion. I'm like, all right, so he's probably going to take the deal. He's got to take the deal. All right, so when are we just going to find out the official word then? Um, but I mean, given how this, uh, you know, how this story has gone on, I'm, I'm almost expecting a twist. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will add this though. Uh, you are you saying that Al Heyman trying to monopolize the sport was good intentions? Because that's what the PBC was intended to do. To uh, so that's like to to monopolize and basically have everyone c join ship with them. Pretty much, that's what they tried to do. Well, I mean, it it seemed it seemed like they were they were on to something once once the the networks were were bought out. And I see it was like a a, a, a a wide spread. I mean, you went from NBC to Fox and uh, Spike. I mean, there was you know. It, it went. It went pretty out there. I think even at points in times was it bounce even had opportunities even uh, showing yeah, fights. Yeah, yeah. 
And and with that, I mean, and, and I got it. You got your your networks of at least who you're trying to show certain fights for. You're almost kind of filling that that void of Friday night fights that's kind of gone. You know what I mean? So so there is at least avenues of it. It's just the fact that they're they're stars, and and they've almost and they kind of laid it out of basically as soon as they got it started of who their stars were. You know, they had them all showed out with their suits and whatnot. You know, walking that uh, fake red carpet scenery and all of that. And basically, of the faces that you can expect to see uh, regularly, and. Once we've just seen him fight, you know, the journeyman, and it's like, all right, well, all right, then we got Thurman Porter. Um, and then after that, it was just somewhat of a lull, and then just it was just infrequent. Um, and I've just noticed it was just seemed like a lot of guys were just getting paid just for really just just not much. And and, and then considering like you we've seen this is almost not even anything new really is just the fact that um is is pretty much is just the, just the crowd sizes are just almost just pathetic really you know um i, I just want to say something to that though uh if we do know yeah quickly Fox, there's going to be the um mikey garcia versus errol spence fight so pbc i already see what they're doing and I don't think they ever restricted anyone from doing anything. I think uh, Daniel Jacobs is at the zone, and he's a fighter that came from the PVC background. I think Al Heyman just manages a fighter where they want to go. So that's what Al Heyman does. So I, I just I kind of disagree with the PVC model being um, a failure. I always seen it as a conduit to go to different places, and um, actually, hopefully push these, the idea behind PBC was to get the fighters into the public's eyes so they know them, so that now they can move on from there to bigger and better things. That's always what I saw the model as. Yeah, I mean, the, the only fault, and just to, and I'm sorry to <laughs> keep adding on to it, is just, I mean, once if you're just selective, though, of who your fighters are fighting and who they can't work with and things like that. I don't agree with that again. Like I said, it's up to the fighter. Danny Jacobs is at the zone right now. Uh, in an area where he can get the most fights. And I don't think Al Haim is going to stop Deontay Wilder from, if he can get a fight with Anthony Joshua, he's not going to stop him from signing with the zone. So I, I believe PVC is actually the best model out there because it doesn't restrict the fighter to just working with PVC. Hmm. Actually, well, if you think about it. Last no, word, Danny, Daniel. Last word before we move on to so previews. I, first of all, no. Danny Jacobs got out of PVC, so he's not involved with him anymore. That's the point. PBC facilitates and allows the fighter to get people can see them, and then it's a conduit to go somewhere else. The fighter determines that. Al Heyman has been helping fighters. But, but, I know, but wouldn't the point be? Wouldn't the point be? Uh, the sorry. fighters end up having their own little smaller promotional companies, just like how Gennady Golovkin now has a promotional company. Um, Danny Garcia has a promotional company. Um, what's his name? Deontay Wilder actually has a small promotional company. It's not licensed or anything. So what they're, what Al Heyman is doing is allowing the fighters to plot their own costs. Mikey Garcia would never be having a fight with Errol Spence if he was in top rank. Mikey Garcia has his own little promotional brand, so he has say on what he does. That's what the PBC is for. Let's, uh, interesting debate, interesting debate. I had to, gotta cut it short because we're a little bit pressed on time. Going to go to some previews here. Going to go to you first, what you need. Uh, uh, the Zon card in Philly, uh, Tevin Farmer, uh, fighter who I'm like, the more I see him, the more I like him, not just because of his style and how he's improving, but I like his attitude and his approach to the game. Uh, won the fight, won his title, uh, June of last year. This is already his third title defense. I like an active fighter. He has an old school mindset. Um, returning to the ring to fight um, Jono Carroll. Listen, I, I don't think that Carroll has can trouble him in any way. But again, for me, the point of this fight, one, is a showcase fight for uh, former in his hometown. Second, more importantly, he's keeping active. And when you're a young fighter in the game, um, it's always good to stay active. So oh, yeah, what, what do you, you mean? Yeah. What do you want me to say again? 
your your thoughts your thoughts your thoughts if you have any commentary on the fights please do do you think okay. carol could trouble him in any way and just your overall assessment of tevin farmer because it's been a while since you've been here and i don't think you talked tevin farmer before here on pound for pound okay so i might sound like a hater Juno Juno Connor Juno Caro, he's a softball. Pressure fighting softball, right? And Tevin Farmer is a softball, right? They're both softballs. Um, I looked at Juno Caro, and he does a lot of wonderful body work. Let me say that again. He does a lot of wonderful body work. The Puerto Rican fighter that uh Lomachenko faced and Javante Davis faced. What's his name? Pedraza. Pedraza. If I'm not mistaken, Pedraza faced Tevin Farmer. Correct? Yeah. And we know what happened in that fight. Qualifier, asterisk, you know Farmer was just coming up. Now, Pedraza fought Te Te uh, Te Tevin Farmer in what stance? Southpaw, yeah. Uh -huh. That was 2012, too. <laughs> that's yeah. Not, that's not the point. Now, everybody hypes up Tevin Farmer as this great boxer. They say Pernod Whitaker, etc. Okay, fine. I, I have no disrespect for that. But I will say this. He has boxing skill. I saw him stop the other guy just recently. Good for him. But I'm going to say this, put pressure on him and let's see what happens. I'll say it again, put pressure on him and let's see what happens. All right, that's all I'm saying. Let's see if he really did grow since his fight with Pedraza, right? I think he has leaps and bounds. Okay, well, we'll see it then, right? So that's why this fight is an interesting fight to me, all right? Um, Pedraza is always a tough customer for anybody because he bobs and weaves, he slips, he goes, he, he um, um, what do you call it? He, he moves backward. I don't know how it's just a snap, but he snaps back. He changes stance. He can be orthodox, he can be southpaw. So he's a tough customer for anybody, right? You saw what happened with Lomachenko. You also saw what happened with uh, Javante Davis. Javante Davis for a minute was a little confused with Pedraza, right? So he's a tough customer, but I'm just saying, Juno or Carl, watch how he enters the pocket when he's when he's attacking a fighter. Does he come straight down the middle or does he come at an angle? These are very important questions. How does he cut off the ring? Does he cut off the ring well? He's definitely, I can tell you this, Juno, Ju, um, Juno Carroll, he's not a one-punch knockout artist. He don't have no metal in his fist, none of that stuff. But I noticed he's a pretty decent body puncher. I get, I get, I'll say it again. The one part, that, the one thing you're guaranteed to hit in boxing, if you're good at it, is the body, right? If you're good at going at the body, that's a good thing to know how to do. Errol Spence is good at going at the body. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that he'll beat Tevin Farmer. I'm not saying that Tevin Farmer won't handle him. But I do know that Juno Carroll will get to his body and land some punches. I've seen how he, he operates off of his jab and stuff. So that's all I'm saying, right? That's, that's basically it. Mm, we will see. Ooh, I just don't see it. I don't think he cuts off the ring enough to get to him. Not consistently. Uh, he may give to him with a few punches, but not consistently. Only thing I can see concern is I did mention Formas fighting a lot. Uh, my thing is that maybe it catches up with him if it. Hello? I think he got cut off. <laughs> the mic, mic got lost. I see him still. No, I think his mic got cut off. Oh. And we see what you need. We see what you need. Yeah. Blasting in. Well, let's let's uh 
sit on the rest of that conversation. We'll see. Hopefully that uh, Michael is is getting back. As uh, every I will I will step in for him just temporarily. Have we con have we concluded that conversation? Have we have we identified who who where you all stand? There we go. And pound for pound is back. Can you hear me now, Michael? Michael yeah. You are yeah. back. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. What happened here. I'm going to Gail talk about this fight on the undercard of Carol and and Tevin Farmer. Uh, Katie Taylor fighting Rose uh, Volante. Katie Taylor, yeah, go ahead. Um, Because I think she's going to be entirely too much with Valente. But what could be potential down the road? We talked a lot about Hammer and Shields. But assuming Taylor wins, we could possibly on the, be on the verge of a second super fight in women's boxing. Your thoughts? Yeah. I, I, we, we get to the women's super fights, if you will, uh, much more quickly because – the women at the top of their divisions in boxing have so little competition. You know, there's just simply fewer women um, fighting overall, which means there are fewer women at the elite level. Well, Katie Taylor has proven herself one of those. Uh, her amateur pedigree is superb, and you know she's got a lot of parallels with the Lomachenkos and Bivols of the world, frankly, because of the amateur pedigree coming in and having tremendous achievements on the professional level after literally in her case, a dozen fights, she's 12 and 0. Valente is once again, one of these potential paper tigers. She is from Brazil. She resides and trains in Brazil and she is 14 and 0 in Brazil, <laughs> never having fought uh, outside South America. And, actually only ever having one fight outside of Brazil um, two years ago, one in Argentina. Um, you look at her opposition, not entirely inspiring. So I think we'll see a very similar situation um, with Volante that we saw with Maurice Hooker and Le Pierre, frankly. Um, Volante uh, and this is also a factor of the women's game. Volante's 36 years old. I mean, you know, time marches on. Um, you can be a very fit, ready to go 36 year old and, and women do tend to fight a little longer because of all the issues we've already mentioned, but still she's 36 years old. So this is a good stay busy fight for Taylor. You know, let us all remember it is essentially St. Patrick's day weekend. Promoters are smart about that, catering to the Irish audience. Katie Taylor is from Ireland, so there you go. Here, here's the super fight potential going with Taylor. Well, first of all, um, again, the problem with the women's game is, and I, I, I apologize repeating myself, but it's just so damn true when we're talking about dealing with this, is you know, there are so few opponents, you know, they're just, Ducking doesn't happen in women's boxing. It just it just doesn't. There's you know, so few of them. So at the top, still, you have Cecilia Brockus, but she's a welterweight. And Katie Taylor is a lightweight. Reminder, women's divisions in boxing, exactly the same weights as the men. You know, if we were talking about a lightweight male and a welterweight male, you know, you know, they would, in a lot of cases, it wouldn't even pass the smell test. So that that's a bit of a problem. And then you have someone like Amanda Serrano um, and her sister, um, who who are up there and bouncing around. Um, she's fought most of her fights at lightweight. Amanda Serrano, same weight class as Katie Taylor. Her last fight, she went down to super flyweight. She dropped twenty five pounds. In those lower weight divisions, imagine a male fighter doing that at uh, at age thirty. This this is what sometimes happens in the women's game. But eventually, all roads are leading upward uh, to some of these women having to face each other and having to jump into uh, either catch weight fights or jumping in between divisions, and one goes up and one comes down because they just don't have all that many options. It's good for fans because it forces them together more quickly 
as the women's side of the sport is growing. I'm a little troubled by some of these crazy weight jumps. I, I don't think it always makes for the best fights, giving these women the opportunity to perform at their absolute best weight, peak weight, whatever suits them best, because they got to make the fights. Um, and you also have Michaela Meyer coming up. Uh, who's a very tall, rangy fighter who I think could probably ramble around several weight classes. So, but Katie Taylor is, you know, destined for a big fight. We did have over the weekend a fight we previewed between um, St. Ville and Delphine, Delphine Persoon, who is from Belgium, who is a lightweight. That's, that's the likely big fight right now is Persoon um, versus Taylor because they are both lightweights and they are the two top ranked lightweights uh and two two of the top arguably 10 maybe five female fighters in the world so that's probably the next super fight in women's boxing um we'll see we'll see if they can make that fight once taylor uh has her little fan friendly fight this weekend and, and i will also add you have senecia estrada out of east los angeles who's very popular she uh currently is campaigning though um, I, at 108, so we'll see if she wants to go up. She's yeah, only five, uh, she's only five two. That'd be awfully tough for her. You're right. Um, uh, Valente is WBO uh, lightweight champion. Uh, Taylor B A I B F, and um, it looks like if uh, Taylor is successful, that uh, we could very well see a Katie Taylor um, Delphine Pearson uh, showdown for all the belts. Uh, rumor is it could take place on the uh, Wilder, Big Baby Miller undercard June 1st in NYC, uh, per, per Pearson um, stopping uh, Melissa Ville this past weekend in, in Belgium. Um, going to you, Daniel, to this next fight, we're going to Japan. Uh, one of our favorite fighters, uh, Kosai Tanaka, fighting former champion um, at 108, uh, Taguchi uh, Tanaka defending his WBO uh, flyweight belt. Uh, you got to give it to Tanaka, Daniel. Um, he, one, he's a very good fighter. Two, uh, he doesn't mind competition. Uh, another tough guy here. Your thoughts? Yeah. If you see, if you saw Taguchi's fights early on, one of at one hundred eight, that's not an easy out by any means. So I'm very, very proud of Tanaka. Like I said, this is a good time for Japanese fighters. There's a little bit in the low of who can keep home base with it in a way still like so we're on the world boxing super series spreading these wings and with casato now also in the states it's like there's a law for like the hometown guy and there's openings for it like Murata's still a big name there tanaka's getting his name you mentioned a guy also uh, you sent us a message i think he was what at straw weight or yes yes weight? yes um uh I'm going. To, I'm not even going to try to say his name. I would butcher it, but uh, 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 a Japanese straw weight, two and zero. I wrote about him for Three Kings Boxing. dot um, com. Um, I, I ain't going to try to pronounce his name, but uh, he's the guy to uh, really keep your eye on. Um, I think he will be champion in um, a couple in eighteen to twenty four months. That's I think that's how good I think he is. Uh, Starts with a G. Like I said, I would try to pronounce it, but I know I, I would butcher it, but proceed. All right. Let me see if I can do it here. Uh, Shinjiro Shikioka. Yeah. Shikioka. Shikioka. Yeah. I just go Shikioka is last. Yeah. That's my best pronunciation of his last name, Shikioka. Yeah. And let's not forget there's Dario Higa. Uh, the, the Higa is still, avail still there. Like he's coming off. I know he did lose, but that, that kid's going to come up still. So it's a good time, and I want to see this fight because Taguchi's going to give him a hell of a test. A hell of a test to get to Tanaka. But I do think Tanaka will prevail. It's just he's going to be too young. It's it's something where, like, it's not similar to Eric Morales, Daniel Zaragoza, because Taguchi, I don't think, has really reached that level of a Zaragoza. But there's certainly dynamics are where the young guy just goes in there, faces the old veteran, and just takes it. 
Mm. I'll go to you, Jacob. Uh, the return of David Benavidez following his suspension for testing positive for cocaine, subsequently stripped of the WBC title, returns to the ring uh, uh, on the Spence Garcia undercard uh, to fight uh, one Jalen. Uh, your thoughts on Benavidez and the comeback against Jalen Love? Jalen Love, excuse me. Yeah, um, you know, it's nice to – it was unfortunate that uh, Benavides had that, that incident. Hopefully he can uh, straighten himself out, and hopefully he has. Um, he was becoming one of those kind of must-see guys, um, you know, coming up where he was um, kind of putting himself at the um, top of the division. Um, I know he had those back-to-back -back fights with Greg Gavril. But uh, I think the consensus was that he was the he was the better of the of the of the brothers, and that he was he was if he hadn't hadn't had this little sidestep, he was the man to beat. Um, with this fight here, I don't I, I expect him to um, to beat Love, um, but I'm I'm hoping that you know him being out of the ring. Um, with the suspension, you know, I don't know how much, um, I guess, ring rust, you know, you have. Maybe he'll he'll need some time to to adjust because it's just over a year now. Um, but he he's a young guy, so he he should be okay. Um, he'll probably do what he normally does and 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 slowly just take apart and love. And um, I expect him to 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 get the KO. Um, you know what love loves loves been around for for a little bit, but. Uh, he lost his last fight to Peter Quillen, who's a guy we hadn't talked about in forever. And uh, they have another common opponent, uh, Porky Medina, that he got knocked out of in, uh, you know, a few years back or five years back. But I expect Benavides to come back strong and start calling everybody out. Um, going to you, uh, George, another fight on the uh, Gar Spence Garcia undercard. Luis Neri fighting uh, McJoe Arroyo. Big fight for Luis Neri, of course. Most he's still coming back reputation-wise from the two fights against Shizuki Yamanaka. Uh, first fight he tested pos positive uh, tests for uh, positive tests, and then the second fight he was grossly underweight uh, at the weigh-in. He beat Yamanaka, but again, the reputation for him went at an all-time low. Recently signed a deal with Dazon, and for him. This is again. This is a a fight to put him back on the banner weight map, and and considerably a, a somewhat of a favor, uh, and <laughs> at least in the opponent that they uh, gave for him, like in Mc, Mc Joe Arroyo. Um, well, let me actually let me backtrack maybe a little bit on that. Um, Arroyo, Arroyo, at least to an extent, does create, I guess, somewhat of, um, I guess, somewhat of a, I guess, a decent challenge of a fight, but, but more or less a, a showcase and opportunity from him. Um, but it, it's always difficult, especially uh, coming off of uh, at least those, those type of defeats, per se. Uh, but I mean, he, th this, again, is a, is a great opportunity, really, to, to really get back uh, right into the limelight. And I don't necessarily see how Really, at this point, how that at least how he ruins that at this point. Yes, he's had a couple of uh, uh, fights um, on the low, but like I said, this is a showcase fight. And whatever you want to say about Luis Neri and his reputation, the the drop, the drug test, the positive test, uh, the first fight with the uh, Yamanaka, uh, the way things went down, the second fight, skill wise, power, he's as good as anybody at 118, 122 pounds. I mean. Uh, him and and in a way would be a barn burner. Him Absolutely. and Tete would be a hell of a fight. Him and Rodriguez, in spite of his issues, I would predict him to beat Rodriguez. So again, um, this is a big opportunity for him. Uh, let's get to the big fight. I want everybody into this discussion. Uh, Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia, main event is going to be, I think, a pay Fox pay-per-view. Uh, that's a lot of different opinions about this there's it goes opposite end either spence too big too strong for garcia or that mikey garcia he's moving up to fight errol spence 
and he's going to pull the upset because he sees something in Spence of a flaw. Let's start the discussion with you, what you need, your keys for Garcia, your keys for Spence, your prediction for the fight. All right, so this is, okay, hold on a second. So this is a 50-50 fight in my opinion because Spence is a damn good boxer. And for those people who don't know that, well, he is. But Garcia, technically speaking, has fought welterweights in his face, Adrian Broner, who has been at welterweight, recently fought at welterweight. And he has also faced another welterweight in Adrian Granados. Okay. I think a catch weight or something. So technically speaking, no, sorry. Mikey Garcia also faced, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the WB, the, the IBF champion at super lightweight, which is, uh, was Robert Easter. No, not Robert Easter. That's lightweight. Um, uh, he's, he's, a, he's, he has an upcoming fight. Um, Relic. No, no, Relic or Baranchik, which one of them? No, at super Wait, lightweight, man. he was the super lightweight champ, IBF super lightweight champion that, uh, that, uh, that Mikey Garcia beat. He means Lepnitz. Lepnitz, yeah, that's, there you so, go. That's, yeah, Sergey oh. Lepnitz, yeah, you're right, him. He's a super lightweight, right? Sergey yeah, lightweight. Sergey Lepnitz, yeah. All right, there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's he's got his foot in, sort of in welterweight technically speaking so in other words mikey's just strengthening himself up now and the other thing is his walk around weight is 152 to 158. so he's he's you know he's a small welterweight but he's a welterweight the thing that we're underestimating are two things one i think a lot of people are underestimating just how good errol spence really is skill wise Two, I think everybody's underestimating. I think even Errol Spence, he's going to learn that real quick. And I was watching Mikey Garcia on the bags. Mikey hits hella hard. He hits very, very hard. He's a, it, kind of like Pacquiao. He's a small guy. He looks harmless until he hits you, right? So those are two things. I, I realize, Mikey, you just listen to him crack on those bags. And you realize oh, this, is, this, this is not the same kind of fight that like Errol Spence has ever faced. Yes, he faced Kell Brook, but Kell Brook looked big and strong. This guy doesn't look big and strong, but I'm pretty sure he's very strong, and I know he hits very hard, okay? Um, how do I know this? I was watching at the Adrian Broder, uh, Mikey Garcia fight. Adrian Broder is a bully. So Adrian Broder would feel you out, and then he would start beating you down. He never did that to Mikey Garcia, so therefore I believe Mikey hits very, very hard. All right, and Adrian Broner is a very strong guy. So from that, I realized, one, Mikey's stronger than he looks, and he hits harder than he looks, and Errol Spence is more skilled than he looks. So from those two equations, I know one or two things are gonna happen. I, I'm pretty sure as good as Errol Spence is, I really truly believe Mikey's smart enough to keep himself from getting knocked out, right? I think he's strong enough to absorb certain a certain degree of punishment, but he's going to be smart enough not to take too much. So I see this fight going to the distance. Now, I can't say if this is what I want. I want Mikey to win because if he wins, this is very bad. I, I hate to say that because I like Errol Spence too. But I want Mikey to win because he'll make history. There's a couple of things that he will do. In one year, one year of boxing, he would have gone through three weight divisions. Super lightweight, lightweight, and welterweight, which would be crazy, right? So that's why I, I think that's just remarkable for any boxer. So I would love him to win for multiple reasons. However, there is no guarantee that he will win. He is very confident. Errol Spence is very confident. 
if I have to pick, I will pick Mikey just because I want him to win. But there's no there's no other reason, really. Right. Um, but I don't see Errol Spence stopping him. And Errol Spence is I, I, I think Errol Spence is very good as a fighter. I think he has some things he needs to work on. Um, Errol Spence, like I was trying to explain to people, he puts sometimes you see the subtlety with uh, Bevo, how Bevo varies the punching power. So he has you guessing. Errol Spence doesn't do that. Everything's with full leverage. Once he gets a chance, bam, you know. And if you're if you're so monotone and doing things like that, it leads to somebody being able to anticipate what you're going to do. And also, when you try to put too much leverage or too much power into a shot, you actually slow yourself down. You know, you don't get that kind of speed and quickness as if you're fully relaxed and just kind of going into the stroke or whatever, the, the shot. The other thing is fainting is a very important thing in boxing people don't talk about much. And while Errol Spence does do some fainting and he comes off the jab at angles, he doesn't do it enough. And Mikey is this kind of guy like Errol Spence, but he does it subtly in certain ways. He's very subtle with his feints and very fluent with his feints. That will come into play in this fight. Now, I'm not saying that Errol Spence doesn't know how to faint. Errol Spence, oh, just one more thing. Errol Spence, the things that Errol Spence does very well, you see that pivot work? That guy has beautiful pivot work. Thank you for saying that. I don't know why he doesn't get enough credit for his footwork. His footwork is phenomenal, okay? He makes a guy go down the wrong line, and then he can counter them. So it's phenomenal with the pivot work. He's kind of poor with the keeping his head out the line of a fire. What he usually uses is the double guard to protect his head, right? But he he comes he comes kind of if he doesn't use angles on you, he gonna get hit in the head. Let's just put it that way, right? So that's the problem with Errol Spence, and Mikey's going to exploit that. And Mikey's not going to stand in front of Errol Spence unless he's weakened him up. He's not going to stand in front of him. He's going to pivot too. And while Spence is good at pivoting, Mikey's very subtle in how he does his pivots. Go watch all his fights. Mikey always is using pivots, and he's using them in a little sneaky little way. He's moving little inches, just slight, slight little offsets so the opponent will miss him. He does get hit, though. And he will get hit in this fight against Errol Spence. Um, mm. So the question really is, in this fight, a lot of people are saying, can he take Errol Spence's power? I, I think I think he can, because Errol Spence is not a one-punch knockout artist. He breaks you down to the body. So he can take the power, but it would be stupid to just provide a slot to get hit with. You know what I mean? You can't be reckless and careless like that. You give him If he gets one in, he earns it, you know? So it's that kind of fight that has to be of course, Mikey's not supposed to stand in front of him, but that doesn't mean he, he he uses excessive energy to try and move around the ring against Spence. I see him bounce, practicing to bounce around the ring. I think that's very expensive. I think he should use more um, pivot work and just slowly in increments pivot around Spence to his weak side. If he wants to go to the lead hand, as Floyd and some other fighters I see do, he better be careful because if he's open in any way, shape, or form, Spence will pounce on that. Spence is very quick, very explosive, very athletic, um, can box on the back foot, on the front foot. Um, he can do the very same things Mikey can do. He can actually circle Mikey and let Mikey come to him. So there's many different things Spence can do in that ring, which it, it's not – It's it, he's such a, a full fighter that – and Mikey, too, that you can't really predict exactly what their strategy will be. It's whatever happens, they will adjust to each other, right? So I'm really intrigued by this fight. This is the fight of the year, in my opinion. Um, I truly believe this is someone, this is one fight I cannot predict the outcome for. I just have to see it, then I'll know. Um, but I do believe this fight is going the distance. It's very possible that either fighter could have their hands raised at the end. That's why I, I, I favor Mikey only because of history that he can make. And I, I, there's so much at stake with this fight, this pay-per-view uh, stardom that can – our pay-per-view star can emerge from this fight. Errol Spence has home court advantage. Not that it will affect the judging, but that he's in his, his own place. He always wanted to have that. He's finally gotten it. It's manifested. I don't see why he can't come out victorious as well. Very easily he could come out victorious. It depends on how the momentum of the fight is, who's first. It's about being first. So who's first? 
uh, who has assessed the situation, who can adapt best. Um, so all of these things. And Errol Spence has been a killer in the amateurs. He's been a killer in the pros. So, I mean, the only thing is I just don't think he's going to run through Mikey like that. <clears throat> Mikey's way too smart for that, I think. Lots of people I know who who know the business, they say to me, you know, they said to uh, publicly that they think the fight will go on for a certain point, but Spence will get the better of Mikey in the end. Um, I can see that happening, but I just think that I just think that Mikey's a little more subtle than they're giving him credit for. So I think okay. that in the end, okay, uh, in the, in the end, what? I think in the end, it's going to go the distance. Okay, I, that that much I can say. I don't know about who will win, but because it could, it very much could be Spence that wins, right? Because he can, he, the dude can box, man. He can box. He's he he breaks even the way how he stops opponents is using boxing skill. He breaks you down, then he stops you, right? So he's that kind of dude. So it's not like Mikey's facing some chump that's just gonna come to him. No, Spence mightn't even come to him. He might let Mikey come to him. You know what I'm saying? So and and, and he may be playing possum or whatever. So, I mean, it, there's just too much variables for me to pre predict who would win. But I can say this. There's some subtleties that Mikey has that Spence, in my opinion, from what I've seen from Spence, I haven't seen it from him yet. Maybe you'll show it in this fight. But okay. subtle, little subtle things that I think Mikey can use that will give him an advantage over Spence. He's still straightforward like Spence in a sort of way, like he's very technical. But... um. Still, that that's how I see it. So I can understand somebody says I think Spence is going to win this fight. I can get I get where they're coming from, but I just think that they're underestimating certain things that Mikey can do and his power. And Mikey is clinic. Mikey ain't going to throw a shot that he he wouldn't land. He will land that shot. So uh, Spence is a guy also who he won't throw a shot that wouldn't land. Right. So it's it's really interesting. Spence to me has one advantage over Mikey, and that is he goes to the body. He goes to the body religiously. Um, okay. So that's an advantage, in my opinion. But who knows that Mikey might go to the body, too? So who knows? And from what I was seeing when he was punching the punching bag, shit. He cracks to the body, man. He cracks to the body. He gets really, really hard. So I'm very I'm very intrigued by this fight. Okay. Um, I know uh, going to Jacob right quick, I know uh, basically from jump, Ever since the fight was announced, he's been saying that uh, Mikey Garcia is going to win this fight. Uh, going to give him the opportunity to explain why uh, his keys to the fight and why does he think Mikey Garcia is going to pull off the upset? Yeah, actually, um, not from the jump because when I remember when this fight was first announced, I the first my first reaction was he's too big. Why is he doing that? But then as I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, Mar Mikey's not a dumb guy. He's he he's he's got he's got good skills, but he's a he's a smart guy. And I started thinking about, okay, why would he do something like this? It's not just about legacy. He 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 must see something in Spence that he can exploit. And the same way that Crawford, when Crawford came into the division, he he wasn't calling out Thurman and and Pacquiao and all these other guys. He went after Spence first. And he's been in Spence's face multiple times. So I'm thinking that's another smart boxer that sees something that they can exploit. So now I'm starting to think, okay, there, there's something there. These, these guys see something. Because um, even Mikey's team was kind of against it. They're like, yeah, I don't know. That's not, that's not a good fight. But Mikey's like, no, no, I want this fight. So, you know, hats off to Mikey um, for, for challenging himself, you know. Um, but – with Spence, you know, he, he's a good fighter. I'm not saying he's not a good fighter. Um, he does go to the body well. He does have good feet. Um, he has decent power. Um, you know, he, he's, he's done a, a lot of great things uh, in that division. But his one, I think his biggest weakness, in my opinion, is that his defense. I think Spence gets hit way too much. In the Brook fight, he got hit a ton. Um, and with boxing... I don't think it's really your size that really, you know, where your power comes from. It's how you throw the punch and where you land the punch. And the the best boxers, you know, can leverage their punches, even if they're, they're, they're smaller guys can leverage it. And if they hit on the right spots, they can hurt a guy. Exactly. And Mike, 
And Mikey, um, you know, he's he's very smart and he's very calculated. He's very cerebral. Um, and I think he, he knows that, you know, I think he knows what Spence is going to try to do. Um, you know, he's going to try to attack the body. He's going to try to to hurt him and make him feel his power. And so maybe in that way, Spence is maybe underestimating him. Um, but, uh, you know, Spence even got shook. I can't remember what fight it was, but it was on the PBC. He got hit with the punch and he, he got a little of uh, those crazy legs. So, you know, he can be hurt and any boxer can be, be hurt. If they get hit in the right spot, the right moment, they can be hurt. Even, even, you know, Pauly Malinaji has knocked out guys before and he's got feather fists. So, so I have all, all those, those factors. And I just think that, you know, Mikey is going to put a good game plan together and really Mikey can't really lose this fight. If he, if he doesn't get blown out in like the first, I would say, you know, five rounds, he, in a way he wins because he's coming up in, in weight at two classes and he's fighting the top, what a lot of people consider as the top, top dog, um, you know, Crawford, notwithstanding, but um, Spence being the top guy, kind of like the boogeyman that nobody wants to fight. So, in my opinion, Spence being in his hometown, if he doesn't like knock this guy out, if he goes a decision, in a way he kind of loses points because his whole kind of claim is that he's he's the guy, but you had a guy come up two weight classes who's going to be obviously smaller than you, you know, size wise, and he took you, you know, if he takes you twelve or takes you to a split decision or if he wins, but if or he, if you don't like get him out like quickly i think that's actually going to do a lot more damage to spence so i always thought it was kind of weird that spence took this fight because i thought it was a lose-lose situation for him because if he loses like actually loses then you know he lost and that's bad but if he wins he just beat a smaller guy i mean that's going to be the first thing that everybody says is that oh he beat a smaller guy you know he didn't be a guy that that has been campaigning at this or even worked his way up to this division so you know, if, and if and especially if Mikey pulls this off in in his hometown, in uh, Spence's hometown, oh man, there, there mm. might be a riot up in there. But I think, but, I think though, honestly speaking, the only reason this fight is so intriguing in a pay per view is because of Mikey Garcia. It's okay, really all eyes are really on him. So I don't think it will affect Spence that bad. Yeah, he's called a boogeyman, so he will not be a boogeyman anymore. But I think it'd be a good learning experience for him if Mikey wins. Um, oh, no, yeah, it'll be any any loss, you know. The the best fighters, when they lose, you know, if they are able to get back on the horse and you know, kind of turn it around, it's always that that you know that learning experience. And most most great boxers have lost at one point or you know, another. And but, Mikey uh, has consistently moved up in weight and beat bigger guys for titles. So it's not really, if you really think about it, Mikey's doing something he always done. So and he's very experienced, much more experienced than 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 Arrow. So it. Errol shouldn't take it bad if he loses. Um, indeed. Let's move on to uh, while what you need and Jacob have made arguments for Mikey Garcia pulling off the upset. Uh, I think George is on the opposite end of the scale. Uh, he's going with uh, Errol Spence in this fight. Give you give you the opportunity to to give your keys to the fight and explain why you feel that um, Spence will win. Um. Usually it's just that gut feeling. I mean, I think usually it's just as most of us fans just know the wave. The, there's usually our initial reaction, our uh, then there's like the pre-fight prediction building, and then the overall your your final uh, prediction. And 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 then through time that can actually change. Um, and and just I, I find quite often though uh, the initial reaction or at least prediction which is usually the the right one. Um, and like most, right away it was, oh, that's Spence right away. Um, and granted, I mean, yeah, it's, um, I mean, the weight advantage for one is something that just, just can't be denied, um, let alone for Spence, as is, is already known to be a weight bully for this division, already known to be a heavy um a heavy welterweight and um i mean and, and granted listen you know mikey garcia's like uh or at least walking walking around weight can always be you know closer just slightly above to what division he's fighting at but at the end of the day you're still rehydrating 
at least seven to 10 pounds still after that. So while he, he can be walking around at 151, that, that probably means he's, he's maxing out at that, just that maybe two or three pounds after a meal. Um, so there, there's still essentially a, a weight difference or at least a weight advantage there. But Manny, but Manny Pacquiao walks around how about 152, 153. So I mean, he hangs with everybody. Well, I mean, obviously Manny Pacquiao is also once in a lifetime type of fighter as well. So I mean, we can't just always just well, buy that as a cookie cutter for everyone. But I go ahead, George. Go ahead. I I don't know. I'm sorry. I kind of kind of got a little. Um, Mixed up there. Wait, what? Uh, I mean, what, what was the what was the uh, response? Though? I'm I'm saying that Mikey is that kind of fighter. That's that's the the argument he's making. Oh, I see. Well, I mean, I mean that's that that's still that's still to be determined. I guess he still has that to be displayed. Um, this would definitely be his Margarito moment if uh if that would be you know um to keep the Pacquiao comparison going. Uh, and with that, I mean, I guess you could definitely say uh, the box of boxing ability um, on Mikey's behalf of, is, is, of course, what makes this even intriguing in the first place. Like, let's get it get it right. If this is any other uh, lightweight, then, you know, we wouldn't even – this wouldn't even be – first of all, this wouldn't probably even be pay-per-view. Um, so this, it's the skill set alone that Mikey brings it is clearly what's the, the intriguing factor here. Um, and, and actually, and when I'm, now that I'm thinking at least as a, at least how most Errol Spence fights go, um, he, he does typically start off a bit slow. Um, so there is actually an opportunity for Mikey and if he can get this to actually go to the decision, and I know it's, it's asking for a lot, uh, especially being, you know, going against the hometown fighter, um, Considering Errol Spence is a slow fighter and, uh, and, and, and even had Kel Brook some pretty good moments early in that fight uh, with, with Spence, if, if Garcia can actually get a good solid, of the, good solid five rounds out of those you know, first six to seven rounds, he could actually be in a great position to actually end up just winning that fight overall. That being said... Um, and considering he has been, you know, knocked down, um, I believe that in the Salido fight. So just like, you know, Errol Spence could be vulnerable to being knocked down p very well in this fight. Um, it was a Rocky Martinez fight. He got knocked down. I'm sorry, Martinez. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it works both ways. So um, granted, and, and, and just like, um, like what Jeannie mentioned, it's not always, you know, going to be just a one knockout punch. Um, and there usually are, you know, accumulation. Um, I don't think necessarily it could really be a knockout per se, um, but the fight could very well wear on him, especially being, you know, just this much outweighed. It's just historically it just always just goes against the smaller guys unless they are that once in a lifetime talent. So, I mean, look, I hope to be wrong in this decision. I hope Mikey actually pulls it off because I really didn't like the fact that this fight was even taking place at all, really. Um, and I, you know, kind of felt more of it was kind of a, you know, backhand, backhanded thing on, on Spence's part. So, so with that, I hope he does actually end up losing this fight. Um, but I, I, I still just, I still think just uh, Spence can't be really denied here. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel and Gail. Uh, your assessment, uh, your breakdown of this fight. First you, Daniel, and then you, Gail. Well, the main thing that you have to focus on in this fight is something that Jacob pointed out is that Mikey's not a fool. He's not going to do something like this. For no reason, not even for money is a reason, even though we know he's fighting for money. The situation is that he probably does see something that with his skill set, he can actually exploit something in his defense, and that is mainly his defense. His defense does 
have a few holes, but he can make up for that in power. Now, what you need talked about in many ways about like how Mikey may have power, but and how he's been able, like Lipnitz wasn't able to bully him as much because he felt the power, or Broner wasn't able to bully him as much because Mikey had power. But what about the fact that Mikey, for all intents and purposes, has not faced somebody that is as big or could probably hit as hard as Spence does? And in boxing, we know the grand rule. Like, you can have the best plan in the world until you get punched. And ultimately, that is going to be the factor that falls in for me. I want to see Mikey win just because of the history. I want to see it, but to me, there's there's always he may be biting something too much. Like I can see the argument for him winning, like, but I can also see the fact that Spence may be too big, his footwork may be too good, his body work may be too good for it to go. Now, that won't be any knock on Mikey at all, but I feel bad for Spence anyway because it's true. Like he beat if he if he beats Mike and he beats him in that way, he will gain absolutely nothing from it. They just say what you beat a guy sure. that you're supposed to beat. What happens if they have an exciting fight though? A really exciting fight. Then that's even more detrimental to Spence. Yeah, because then you had to go life and death with a lightweight. Yeah. That's no, even but, more but detrimental Sugar to Spence. Ray did. Sugar Ray Leonard did. Uh um and 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 Sugar Ray Leonard was still loved. I, I just I truly believe that. And Mikey, by the way, he spars naturally bigger guys he all the time. So I think he's going to be in a position, especially with the RGBA gym, Robert Garcia's gym. They prep those guys. I went with how Jose Cito Lopez was against Keith Thurman, and that, that gave me a blueprint as to tell me, well, if Jose Cito Lopez is ready like that, Mikey's going to be super ready for, for Spence. So I do believe Mikey's not going to be a slouch in there. But what I'm saying is, if it's a super exciting fight, that's what the fans want. That's it's what the fans want, but the Spence won't get oh, yeah, yeah, we nothing went, from it. it. It just, yeah. Oh, it's it just, it, 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 it's an exciting fight. It put points on Spence because if the pay per view attraction, Spence would have been in a mo in an exceedingly exciting fight. The guy who was mowing down everybody, all of a sudden, he's got competition and it's a smaller guy. It's like Pacquiao versus Cotto. It's like, uh, it's like, um, Shane Mosley versus Oscar De La Hoya. It actually makes you more famous. Yeah, you are. But it, it makes you more famous. It makes the guy that's doing the actual moving up more famous. Oscar was already you. at that level when Mosley came but into no. the fight. Mosley's the one that gained most from it. The thing about Spence is Spence will gain the only way to gain if it's an exciting fight is if he wins. If he has an, if they have an exciting no, fight, no. No, that's Jose, not Jose no. Cito Lopez just lost against Keith Thurman. Jose Cito Lopez got big points. See, everybody always thinks boxing's about winning and not losing the O and all that nonsense. No, it's about exciting fights, right? Off so comparison. Go to it's watch. a different you off comparison. Yeah. Really off comparison. Yeah, and One, that's a really, really bad comparison because Jose Cito Lopez has been fighting at Baltimore. And point. Thurman was coming off of basically a two year layoff. Yeah, but Jose Cito Lopez shocked everybody by giving their um Thurman the work. He gave him the work. Nobody expected Jose Cito Lopez to do that. And same, okay. So Mikey Garcia is the one we're going to be watching in this fight, not Errol Spence. And uh, for me, at least, I'm watching Mikey, not Errol Spence, really, because to me, it's Mikey who's making the big leap. That's what makes this fight so exciting. So and that's really, and that's the reason why he's the only person that can gain something from it. Like, that's no, I disagree, that. I disagree with that. I disagree with that because he's because just gonna Errol Spence, everybody's been ducking Errol Spence. Nobody wants to fight Errol Spence. So you can't fault Errol Spence for accepting a fight with a smaller fighter, just like how you can fault Floyd Mayweather for accepting the smaller Marquez who wanted to be great, jumped up two weight classes like Pacquiao did to face Mayweather. I mean, that's what makes great fights great fights. But what did if, Floyd if gain if from Leonard being up Marquez? Up okay, to, to, first, to first of all, okay, if you're gonna throw, if you're gonna throw Hagler, Floyd and Marquez, we have this great Hagler Leonard fight. No, okay, you can go in that. You, we can go in that direction in that sense. But remember, her, uh, Hearns and Leonard and Durant had to go through each other before they got to Hagler. 
And then if you're going to throw the Floyd comparison into it, what did Floyd gain from that fight? Nothing. Nothing. If anything, he got more heat because of the way he came in. He was immortalized because of that fight. Immortalized. No, he wasn't. No, no he, he wasn't. Yeah, no, he got a lot of shit for that fight. No, he wasn't. He was no, he wasn't. He Hagler. You have to because why? He beat Hagler. And it was controversial. And some people thought Hagler won, and some people thought Leonard. That's the kind of fight you want. If it ends up being a split decision and somehow Mikey wins, nobody loses that fight because it was a hell of a fight. People will say, let's do it again. I don't know about that. Context is different here. Leonard uh, did, did, did he just Leonard. switch? Wait, wait, did he just switch the Floyd Marcus argument to immediately go to Leonard and Hagler? Did I just see that? <laughs> I'm not buying. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying. I didn't it. switch anything. I said it's a smaller guy fighting a bigger guy, right? So we assume that the bigger guy is going to win, right? This is what everybody assumes. Errol Spence is this big killer. Right, he has a reputation for being a killer, so we expect the killer to destroy the smaller guy. But here's where the fight gets interesting. This is what boxing's all about. What happens if the smaller guy is not getting killed, and he's actually holding his own against the bigger guy? Then Such we like win those fans, and Roberta he loses Durant his perspective. Versus, Roberto Duran versus Marvel, Marvel Hagler. Hagler said that was his hardest fight of his life. Small guy, come up from lightweight. That's what we live to see. Yeah, but it's good for us. It's just not good for for, good for, for him because in the now, sense that, like, wow, you just got showed up by a smaller guy. If if your younger brother just came up and just beat you up in front of all your friends, that doesn't make it Nobody great for your guy's you friendship. Up. It makes if you, get a competitive, if you have a competitive fight, you're not getting beat up. It's a competitive fight. Everybody remembers Duran versus Sugar Ray Leonard, right? Everybody remembers that. Right, that's what immortalized Sugar Ray Leonard to a degree because that fight was something nobody expected to have that outcome, and that's the glorious thing about boxing. So that will that will make Errol Spence so much more popular, strangely, by losing the fight. And if he wins it by split decision, it makes him more popular because people are going to talk about it. His name's going. What to made? What made? Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! I got to stop here. What made Leonard more? popular in the Duran fight was how he fought. Context is critical here. You just can't just throw this thing, a smaller man, hey, so, man so what happened with Marvin Hagler? When Hagler faced, um, it's how he fought? Come on, man. Look, look. And when, when, when Hagler, it, it is, it is, it is, it is what you excited. need. It, Arturo Gatti lost to, to, to Mickey Ward. Nobody expected Mickey Ward to beat Arturo Gatti. You see what I'm saying? And the tour guy was beating up Mickey Ward until it became a fight. That's what you want to see. You want to see something where the underdog gets competitive with the guy. And if he and if we guy, and if we, everybody if, likes and that. If, but and the if, guy if, who gets beaten, he gets respect too. And if you're going to go, back. and if you're going to go, Leonard, not Leonard, but Hagler Duran, Hagler's a rep did a rise about that. The thing Hagler was criticized for, and Hagler even admitted himself. Was how how tight he fought. His 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 reputation didn't rise from that. Oh come he on, was man! Still a it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't. Bottom line, it didn't. Um, Hagler was still a dominant champion, but Hagler got the rep got got the respect of everybody when he beat Hearns, not when he beat Duran. Oh oh oh! Well, let me say. I think he got respect from people for beating Durant because he re they realized how tough that fight was, right? And for it's the, the beauty of these fights, right, is when a smaller guy can prove himself and, sh and show that I hang with the big boys. But on top of that, to see that the big boys are saying, no, they pushing back. If you don't push back, you can't have an exciting fight. The big guy, when he realizes that his size ain't working, he know he had to go to something else. So, and they have to dig deep. And to see two champions digging deep to go at each other, it's awesome, man. Mikey Garcia is the lightweight champion. Errol Spence is the uh, welterweight champion. They're both IBF champions, right? To see them smash head to head and go down the, the road, it, people don't expect it to be that. Some people don't expect it. They expect it to be a quick fight. Errol Spence gets him out of there. I know it's not that, right? So I'm, I'm licking my lips saying, oh, my God, this is going to be a good, great fight, right? 
And that's the thing. Sometimes the great fights pop up on you. But believe you me, people are going to remember Errol Spence and they're going to remember Michael Garcia. This fight ends up being a, a, a tremendous fight. They're going to remember them. Let's get, Gail into, let's get Gail into this discussion because we've been leaving her out. Your thoughts on this, Gail? Oh, I have been happily sitting on the sidelines in the front row chewing my popcorn with a fury over here. So thank you all. Um, without wearing the audience out too much more, there is no downside in this fight for Mikey Garcia. Let's say he loses. He still gets to go back and uh, uh, to his uh, previous perch um, in the lightweight division and still has two belts. He, he loses nothing in this fight. He, he gives away nothing. He takes a little bit of a risk moving up for great reward. That's exactly what fighters are supposed to do. Now, here's what I think is very possibly going to happen. I'm not, I'm not convinced we're going to get a barn burner of a fight. Mikey Garcia, let's also remember, Mikey Garcia for many years has been very lukewarm about his boxing career. He has other aspirations. For many years, he wanted to be in law enforcement. The fact that he's in boxing is because he's just so damn talented and so damn smart. There's just there's money to be made, and he can't deny it. So he has wisely stuck with it, and I think he's realizing he made the right decision. Garcia can, if he decides he wants to turn this into a tactical boxing affair, he can win this fight. I think, frankly, fairly easily. Will that, that be the most entertaining thing we ever saw? For most fans, no. They want to see a blood and guts fight. They want to see Gotti Ward. I mean, they want to see Salito Vargas. Every time, I get that. But Garcia has a damn good chance to win if he can impose a tactical fight on Errol Spence. I think that might be what we see. I think it might not get the greatest reviews in the world, but he might damn well walk away with that title if he does so, if he can impose that version of the fight onto Earl, Errol Spence. I think if it becomes a bloodbath and a, a all-out war, Spence has got the upper hand. Um, but I don't think it's going to go that way, and that ups the odds for Garcia pulling off what would admittedly be an upset. Here's my question. Now, I hadn't heard anybody talk about this. If Spence establishes the jab in his lane, how is Garcia going to get to him? When we know while he has footwork, he doesn't have the ability to dart in and out a la Manny Pacquiao. If he establishes the jab in the lane, how is Garcia going to get to him? Well, that's a great question because the thing is, it's who could touch who first with the jab tells them if they have control in the game, right? But the thing about it is what a lot of people seem to forget is it's all about angles in boxing. That's how Canelo, who has a very a significantly um, high reach disadvantage against other longer, longer opponents, he's able to get to the inside of them. So that's where if you practiced <laughs> your pivot work and if you've practiced slipping jabs, rolling them, et cetera, et cetera, if you practice that kind of stuff, you're going to get to the inside of a jab. That's how Pacquiao, who is extremely short, <laughs> gets to the inside of Floyd Mayweather and catches him in the fourth round. It's called counter punching. And there's many different ways to do it. There's many different ways to do it, right? It's, it depends on how you, you conduct your stance, et cetera, et cetera, right? But there are many ways. A taller guy, you can let him come to you and you could counter him from that way. Um, if, you're, if you're a shorter guy, you could bob and weave and work your way inside. Or you don't even have to bob and weave. You could just how you do your pivot work can make you make the guy be a step behind you, and then you can easily do what you have to do with the jab. Yeah, but you still you still missing my point. If he establishes the jab, fighting well, mid range, well, fighting well, mid range. If, if if he fights, if, let me finish. If he fights, if he establishes the jab, mid range out, and he forces Mikey Garcia to come to him, how is Garcia gonna beat him? No, but my point is, if you establish the jab, it means you're hitting somebody with the jab. You got to touch. That's what I mean. Right. Now, if he touches him, if he, gets, if, he, if he establishes and hits him with the jab first, and right. he makes so Garcia forces that's Garcia to come to him first. You got to be first to dictate, right? You got to be first to dictate. 
So it's about being first. So, and then the other thing is, they're not, he's not just going to just come out there and establish the jab just like that. He has to test out both Errol Spence and Garcia. They have to find their appropriate range, right? So to get the jab, he has to find the range first, right? So they'll come out and they'll do their thing and they'll circle one another and, and so on, right? So I'm just saying, there's a lot, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go into just what you see these guys doing so very fluently. And all I'm saying is footwork is a key. Errol Spence is very good with pivot work. Garcia is not bad with footwork. He's very subtle with his footwork. And then the other key is, like you say, getting to touch the guy. If you could touch the guy, all right, the fight has begun. And you can be in control if you want to. But it will be ebbs and flows anyway. But you're saying if he establishes the jab. So I'm not, I'm not getting Errol Spence. I'm just saying that that's the if factor right there. It's to get that jab. Because once you get the jab in, that's it, right? So that's all I'm saying. Right. I'm not saying that he won't get it, but I'm also saying it's not a guarantee that just because he has a longer reach and he jabs a lot, it means that he's going to get the jab in. Right. That's what I'm saying. True. And, and I'm just saying that for me, jab. it's the type of jab as well, because a lot of people think jabbing is just one thing, a power jab. No, there are different kinds of jabs and there are different angles off of which you can use different kinds of jabs. So depending on what kind of jab, uh Errol decides to come in with and what kind of jab say for instance Mikey might want to counter him with or even lead off with could determine how this fight goes see my I'm going with this and the reason is everybody talks size 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 which is true my thing is he's the longer fighter and his intelligence is is, is underrated and his footwork is underrated Garcia is going to have his moments, particularly early, but over time, the length as well as the size is going to take is going to is going to be the difference in this fight. I, I don't think, know if it's going to be the most early. exciting fight. Let me finish. I don't think it's going to be the most exciting fight, but I believe that Spence over time will be able to get to Garcia first. I think he's going to establish his jab first. Once he does that, everything is going to roll. From there, but, but the thing, is roll from there. The thing that you forget is Errol Spence is not really an outboxer. He can outbox, but he really does most of his work on the inside to mid range, right? He do body work. He's an inside fighter mostly. So there's a couple things that maybe. All right, so he will come come to. He has to come to Mikey because his strong point, his strong game, is at a range at which he wants to throw those hooks. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, he might jab from the outside. You see, there's so much. I tell you, it's very complicated. But he could jab from the outside, right? But his goal is to get to the inside. So Mikey doesn't even have to, depending on how the fight goes, Mikey may even have to look for him. And plus, so then, for me. When Mikey, wants, when Mikey wants to fight him, he could set up to fight him. When Mikey doesn't want, you see, it's, it's, it's a lot of things I'm saying here. Errol Spence could do the same thing, too. Don't, don't get it. That's what I'm saying. You see my point. We need to about how much what Mikey Garcia can make. You know, no, Errol, Why are we assuming that Spence can do the same thing? Errol, Errol is, is the joint, right? <laughs> no doubt about it. He no, Let me just make it abundantly clear. That's why I said I can't predict the result. I have to see what they'll do. Errol is equal to almost any task that Mikey could bring. Errol could, has a counter for it. That's what I'm trying to say. There is a way to counter everybody. So is this that's what makes this fight intriguing because it's it's gonna be cerebral. A guy gonna have to make an adjustment. Round by round, you're gonna see different things from the different fighters as they make adjustments to one another. That's what I'm looking forward to. I don't know if I'll get it, but that's what I'm looking forward to. So I'm I'm only talking about Mikey because a lot of people think he's too small. It's this fight is not about size, it's about skills. It's about skills. That's the truth, and and how you use your skills. So so, Errol's not. Don't sleep on Errol. 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 <laughs> I mean, if Mikey makes a mistake, Errol gonna crash him, and we guarantee Mikey's gonna get beat up real bad, and then he's gonna be out of there, right? If Mikey makes a mistake, right? But it doesn't mean that if Errol makes a mistake, he gonna get away either. That's all I'm saying. Because a lot of people underestimate, they think, oh, Mikey's too small, so if he hits Errol, nothing will happen, and blah. And they just, they think Errol's just gonna roll over Mikey. So that's why people say Errol's reputation will be affected and stuff. It's not that kind of fight. 
And it, the be the more we think like that, the better. We won't be disappointed. If Errol rolls over Mikey and, and just blows him out of the water, so be it. He was Some people would say he was supposed to do that, right? And it'll just show how good he is because Mikey has continuously faced bigger guys and beat them. That's all it will show, right? And it just means pay-per-view event with Manny Pacquiao next. That's all it'll mean. Mm. Uh, my thing is this. It's a mistake to sit here and say, while Mikey is skilled, he's so much skilled for Errol Spence that he could just outthink this guy. No, no. We're underestimating the intelligence of this dude. Absolutely. It's not just the fact, it's not just the fact that he's uh, bigger and stronger and a bit of a weight bully. This guy can box. And formerly. This guy can really box. Oh, he really can. For, no, for sure. And I think sure. if, if, if Garcia, size does matter in this. If Garcia, if Garcia was more of a natural welterweight, I'd give him a real, real good chance. But he's not. And I think because Spence can really, really box, coupled with his size, coupled with, I don't care what anybody says, he's going to hit Garcia. And I've seen Garcia put it this way. I don't trust his chin. I've seen him put down. I've seen him hurt, and I know he has issues with his nose. His nose has been broken more than once. You put all that together, I'm going with Spence in this bout. Good. I'm going with Spence. All I'm saying is I don't see Mark. I don't see Mikey Garcia getting stopped. That's all I say. Um, I I, 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 fav, I only favor Garcia. I, it has nothing to do with boxing. It's just having a history. But as to say that, in other words, you just I, favor him for legacy's sake. Yeah, only for legacy sake. It had nothing to do with the fight. The fight, I'm not sure about. I'm, I'm anxious to see this fight for that reason. But um, Errol Spence is no slouch, man. The, he's not just a good boxer. He, we're going to see how good he is because he's, he's very, 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 very good. Very good. And I'm talking about really refined in every single way as well. So, yeah, I would love to see this. This fight, I'm, I'm eager to see the fight for that reason. I know it's going to be a tactical fight, but it's going to be explosive at certain points. It's going to be very explosive yeah. at certain points. Uh, George, Daniel, Gale, last word on this. Watch it. It's going to be good. Watch it. Yeah, I've said either, that. Uh, well, either history will be made. Two, three things will happen. Either history will be made. The expected outcome can come into it, or God help us, Texas will be Texas. It, and and maybe it, I guess it will add. And, and if for some reason we see a master class performance, and and Mikey come at, comes out of this, I mean, just absolutely pearl. Credit to him. <laughs> I would love that. That's actually that again. This is what I'm totally behind again. But I've I've I've, I've seen boxing history long enough to see how this play turns out. Just gonna say. And, and and I think we're going to uh, um, shut the show down on that note. Um, I hate to end the show on a downer, but uh, this must be mentioned. Um, thoughts and prayers to one um, Kayla Plant. Uh, for those who don't know, boxing wise, uh, news broke uh, Saturday. I saw it across my Twitter feed that his uh, mother uh, was shot and killed uh, due to a disturbance in um, Tennessee. While Plant didn't put put a specific post to this, he implied to um, her death. Uh, only 51 years old, uh, Plant, who, by the way, just recently uh, it was announced that his first. Um, Title defense, I think it's going to be in his home area. Oh, wow. um, he's going to be, uh, he's had some real difficulties and troubles going up. Uh, daughter has passed. So this is just another uh, a sad event um, in this life. So yeah, um, in spite of the animated discussion that we've just had, um, still, um, I want to uh, give thoughts and prayers, not just from here, from myself and from everyone here at the book, Pound for Pound Boxing Report 2-1. Um, Kayla Plant. Um, I want to thank um, Guts from Corruption and Boxing 
EJ Boxing Live for joining us in the live YouTube chat. Um, I think it was Ortiz who was in there as well. I want to thank Jacob who joined us early in the show. Um, if you want to talk boxing with him or movies, because he's also a, a guest on the Wrong Real podcast, occasional guest there, you can check him out on Twitter, um, J-R-A-T-M. You can, you can also check out his work over at uh, jabhookboxing.com. Um, going to go to you, Daniel, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk uh, the NBA, specifically the Miami Heat. Uh, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Oh, uh, yes, folks. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ruckus99. And like I say, you can do my show with Joe and Francis for boxingnews.com. We should have a show up later this week. And definitely catch on because. Let's see. We're going to see history one way or the other. And once again, like uh, follow your sentiments. Uh, my condolences to Caleb Plant. Perhaps that man has had a rough, rough few years. Indeed, he has. He has. Communities, digital news for those who want to talk to sweet science, for those who want to talk uh, small business advice, Game of Thrones, Dancing with the Stars. Let the folks know where they can find you. Game of Thrones, 32 days and counting. You can Indeed. find me at Community. <laughs> you can find me at Communities Digital News. That's com, C O M M, Digi, D I G I News, com, Digi News dot com. And uh, Michael, thank you for mentioning um, from all of us our condolences to Kayla Plant and his family. Nobody should lose any family member to violence particularly not your mom it's just not the right way of the world so i'm sure she'll be looking down on him guiding him and blessing him in all his fights to come indeed i would give details i wrote about this for three kings.com but her her death is still um under investigation i'll go to you george from uh hands of fire uh, boxing podcast um for those who want to talk to sweet science or anything else uh, you can find you Yes, uh, Hands of Fire by title, uh, but the channel you can catch me is Georgie Dampier. Uh, same for my Twitter handle as well. Uh, Facebook, George Ali Dampier, uh, G.Ali6 on Instagram. Uh, particularly would note uh, either any of those platforms really to follow me on, and particularly tonight, uh, I'll be in attendance for uh, the General Carroll and Tevin Farmer. Uh, press conference tomorrow, uh, as well as weigh-in, and uh, of course the fight on Friday night. Um, so I'll have uh, some some live feeds there if you guys want to get any um, get any looks there. And if any uh, banner, just in general, um, you can catch me at Ring IQ Boxing uh, and UIQ. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, UK Boxing Group uh, and FC Hooligans as well. If you just wanted to just talk soccer as well, big soccer fan. Indeed, indeed. And last but certainly not least, what you need. Uh, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science or, or, or uh, anything else, um, let the folks know where they can find you. You can find me at What You Need on YouTube. And basically, we have started back the series Boxers Not Talk Much About. We did look at Eater, Joe Frey, Asselino Freitas, Ken Overland, uh, Ponsilac, uh, Har and Harry Simon. Yeah, those are some of the boxers that uh, I guess people don't know that much. I also talked about uh, the hypocrisy of boxing purists, historians, and some old timers. So I just want to stir up the pot a little bit more again. <laughs> oh, oh wow, oh wow. Um, again, um, if you like what you heard, uh, please hit that like button on YouTube. Please hit that subscribe button um, on YouTube as well as um, iTunes, uh, Spotify. Again, I want to thank EJ Boxing Live, Gus Corruption in Boxing, Ortiz, uh, J. Will, Jacob, who had to dip. Uh, he's in, he's in the live YouTube uh, chat as well. And like I said to begin the show, we're now on iTunes. Um, if you want to talk to Sweet Science, uh, music, uh, fitness, uh, Gail, Daniel, uh, fitness challenge um, starting in May. Um, you can check me out on Twitter, uh, Brother JR at Brother JR76. Um, as I said to begin the show, if you want to find out all things regarding Powerful Pound Box Report, the blog page is the place to go to, p4pboxerreport.wordpress.com. Check the right of the page. You'll find links to find us on social media, links where you can find all available platforms that carry spot, podcast, excuse me, and um, 
not all, most things are not free, including the protection of this podcast. So yeah, uh, got a donate button. Let donation be the best nation. Got a cash me um, app and got a cash me app um, and another uh, donation uh, app. The links to that as well. Uh, on the next episode, we will do a recap of Farmer Joan O'Carroll. Uh, recap of Katie Taylor's fight, uh, Kose Tanaka uh, and Taguchi, uh, and a recap of the um, Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia card. I don't know if we'll be have a show next week because it's kind of light. Um, I may do some, if we have a show, I'll do a discussion about um, uh, Joshua Bawatsi, who I think is the best uh, <laughs> UK light heavyweight prospect. Um, not Yard. I think he's that good. I think he's an eventual world champion. So if we have a show, we'll talk about him. Um, Charlie Edwards, who's defending his flyweight title. Uh, Lawrence Acoli, who made some noise who for calling out Dillian White for a fight. So if we have a show next week, uh, we'll certainly do a recap of all the boxing, but we also may uh, preview some uh, boxing that taking place over in England. So this has been episode two. Uh, 44 of Pound for Pound Box Report. Certainly a long one, no doubt about that. Um, I don't know if I'll split this up or just do it one long show. So yeah, episode 244 Pound for Pound Box Report. Fort Gill from Communities Digital News. Uh, George of Hands of Fire Boxing. Uh, what You Need. Uh, Jacob from Jab Hook. Daniel from Me and Swiber. I'm your host, Michael. Everyone have a good evening. Good night. Good night.